Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are premiering, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is a particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So, a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Sarah Griffiths, Rob H, Ben White, Maximum Gravy, Austin Whitsitt, John Kays, Tommy Swagnett, Michael Kahn, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuker, Bose Nail, Samson, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Mac 777, Neo The One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Mike, Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Liam, Redrick, uh, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, TheFlatEarthChannel.com, Texas Mike, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. See if they come in. Oh, I've been in debate since I doubt it. Can... 5 o'clock in the morning. And I'm just all three or four of them all just piling up on me. And I'm just schooling their ass. Can't even give me a hypothesis of gravity, but it's the cause of something or an effect. And scientific method isn't the only method to get the answer. So we're going to use unicorn farts to get the answer for everything that we just can't explain. Makes sense, right? Are they still singing the same tune? Oh, absolutely. For the last three and a half hours, man. Well, M. well I'm using a very the most simplistic approach, the black, the, um, the sextant, the year of the, the sextant, sextant, 2021. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. I brought that up, and uh, Professor Phil claims to be in, in, in uh, orbital mechanics, and he's in charge of satellites or whatever. And somebody asked him what, what, what the names are some of, uh, some of his satellites. No answer. And I said, oh, or orbital mechanics. Okay, well, where's your R uh, value then? Nothing, silent. Oh, well, it's no secret. Okay, so then what is it if it's no secret? I didn't say it was a secret. I'm asking you what it is or where it came from. And the response you got was? Nothing. I, I don't need verbal abuse from from people who think that the Earth is flat. Yeah, these people he doesn't have it. <laughs> Nothing. And they don't. But it's interesting, all the same. Good to hear that you've been out there battling the good fight. Yeah, for the last three hours. <laughs> First, it was... It was uh, um, Jim Baroni at like five o'clock in the morning. Then his buddy, uh, who the heck was the other guy? There's another guy, and they were both ganging up on me, and none of them could give me straight answers. They would just, they would answer my question with another question about another topic. So they never conceded even what gravity was. And then Coffee House decided to join in. And then Professor Phil, so I, I'm, I was battling four of them all at the same time, and none of them gave conceded on any of the points that I made, and we, we're still not we're still not in agreement of gravity is not a force. Okay, give me your hypothesis of gravity then, if it's if it's a cause of something or an effect. So scientific method should give you all these answers. Oh well, uh, we said a coffee. Your your IVDB is. Uh, isn't relevant to this because we can just observe it and see it and that's it. 
where there's no scientific or logical explanation of it. It's just there. Like, okay, unicorn farts. They're just there. What's just there? He's saying it's just there. What is it? Gravity. Gravity is just there. There's, they have no explanation of why gravity is there, what is causing gravity, uh, the equation for the force of gravity on everything, because gravity needs to have an equal effect on every object on Earth, including gas like steam. But like I said, it's it's there is no uh, there's no relationship to anything. So I called it pseudo. Then it's all pseudo. It's all fake science. Sure, but That's assigning it a word and having you say, well, it's not proven, did they ever actually qualify what they mean? So when a fundy says gravity, usually the, the question that follows is, well, if they're someone you're acquainted with, which one? And you've, you've stepped into the fantastic realm of just asking them to, to provide a hypothesis for this, right? Which is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did. I asked him. I said, okay. That was actually one of the first thing I asked. Okay, which which uh, gravity are are you referring to? And I I let him answer Einstein's or or I forget which one he said Newton. I said okay, well Newton's is is 107 years out of date, and Einstein superseded his, and he also states that gravity isn't a force; it's a bend of space and time, which are both concepts, and concepts aren't real, so you cannot bend uh, unicorn parts. You know. So that is it. You won. That was the end of the argument, and you're saying in uh, advancement of that there, were, there was nothing. So that was the end of the argument then. Yeah, it just it just uh, proceeded on to uh, another subject that I tried to bring them back to gravity, and it, it was just honestly a clusterfuck of nonsense from them, and me trying to prove to them that gravity isn't a force. And I've asked them to hypothesize it, and they laughed and said, "Oh, well, we don't need to hypothesize gravity because it's just there. It's it, it's so." Yeah, that that's the bit I was trying to drive to towards chaos. So you say they said it's just there. You're like, well, what is just there? What exactly are we observing then? Right, and they said, uh, "Hang on, it's I got three hours worth of chat to." go back to and, and memorize. No, 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 <laughs> There's fair four enough. different people on me, so it got a little no, no, that's fair enough. That's as fair enough. I'm trying to work, too. I'm, I'm not trying to drag out the actual full verbatim account of what went on. I'm just trying to say that at some point you've got to actually, with somebody that just says, well, we don't need to establish cause and effect relationships or science this. It's just a thing, and it just is what it is. Like me saying, well, entropy is just a thing. We observe it occurring always. That's why it's a law of nature. Because we always observe high pressure to low pressure, hot to cold, entropy increase. That's something that occurs always. So you describe it. You're not establishing the cause of it. You're just describing it. And they say, well, we're just describing it. We're just describing gravity. Okay, what exactly is it that you're describing as gravity? What exactly is it that's happening? Now, we all know it's down 9.8 metres per second per second. That's what they're claiming, right? Other than the fact that things go up. Now, they're not going to relinquish either, because in spite of them having bending geodesic concepts in space-time, total nonsense that we don't experience in reality, they still want a force to do various things that they can't get around when they've got a heliocentric belief. So they're never going to concede it, because later on down the road in that discussion, if they had a conceded it and they say, well, gas holds all the gas here, making it go down and going boom-boom, because they haven't conceded it, they can still throw it up as their argument, because when you've pointed out how it isn't a force and the one that they think is is 106 years out of date, superseded by Einstein, as soon as they concede that, they've never got any arguments for anything ever because almost all of their arguments that have got tricky, sticky situations at the end end in them going, gravity, that, that solves it. But what, what is it? That's my point. What is it? What are we observing? What is gravity? Not, oh, Einsteinian or, oh, Newtonian. It's like, no, no, what happens? What's, what's the phenomena that we're observing? There isn't Nathan, one. I was just going to ask you, is, isn't that an indictment on its own? As soon as you ask them the question, which gravity, and they begin to answer it, they hang themselves right there. Well, yeah, because either or, if they say mass attracts mass, mass doesn't attract mass. 
you know, if they're going to ascribe that a downward vector, well, we've got things that go up. So, you know, that's why it's 106 years out of date, superseded by the pseudo Ramonian force space. But then you go, well, that's a conceptual medium with space time bending. You know, you can't bend time. That's nonsense. So, you know, you're telling me that's how our world works when it's a fourth dimensional conventional uh, convention that's been invented by Einstein. Go on, go on. It's in their mind. Yeah, so that, I mean, I pretty much stated uh, what you said um, almost verbatim because uh, it, it's obviously true. Um, we haven't really can, um, come to a conclusion on what gravity was. So I basically defined it as not being a force. And then we went into uh, gases and how gases go up and gases go down, brought up the steam. It's just literally like a, a general Glover versus Flat Earth um, science topics uh, that we went over and they just completely pushed everything aside. Uh, so I tried to get them to voice chat because I, I didn't have time to be freaking messaging back and forth. The 2015... The whole body of science proves the sphere. 2021 slash 2022. We don't want to talk about science. We don't need science. Science doesn't even prove anything anyway. From the globe side. Yeah, well, that's M. Scott Veach. He says that was just the beginnings of science. Now we've advanced. It's not just a scientific method. Well, yeah, they need you to go into la-la land. Yeah, you approach a con man and go... You realise we've got an empirical method to validate some of your claims. Have you put your claims through that method that could empirically validate them? Wow, well, we've advanced beyond the dusty old empiricism. We've gone way beyond that. We don't need to prove things like we did with the scientific method. Science is much more about telling stories now. OK? You can go away with your dusty old empiricism. Nathan, science is out of date. Now it's math. The math is not science. Correct, but that's what they're pushing, that math is the new science. Math is what proves things. That's like yeah, saying like language that, proves like things. Really good... No, no, language doesn't prove things. Language describes things. It's a, a means to an end in that respect. You can create a description Absolute. in mathematics, but it doesn't prove anything. Nathan, if, my, if I may give, give a perfect, practical, real-life example of how math describes reality and nothing more. I, I build fences, right? So if I need to put up a, uh, a deck and I need three eight foot posts, right? Now in math, we could write that down as three times eight or eight times three. But in reality, those two things mean completely different things. For example, or three times eight, both equal 24 of the value of whatever we're using. But for example, in my example with the wood, 24, Three times eight foot posts would be 24 feet worth of wood, foot length worth of wood. But in reality, if I say to my worker, hey, go to the hardware store because I need three eight foot. He can't come back with eight three foot posts. You see what I mean? So in, when you use math to describe reality, you're using them to describe a value and how many units of that value. So if you on paper, three times eight and eight times three give you the same result. They'll give me both 24 foot length of wood. But in reality, practical use of math, if I sent my worker to go get me three eight foot posts, he can't come back with eight three foot posts because that won't build me the deck. Right. Further to that, in your example, you didn't mention to the audience that these posts were actually unicorn horns. Uh, black holes. I'm saying, in your example, let's say that you explain to the end of your example that you, you guy's gone off and he's actually understood that you want three lots that are eight foot, and he comes back with that, right? And after the fact, you go, great, but in your story, it started off with you having the guy off looking for posts made of unicorn horns, Yeah. So it's 3x, and then whatever x is, is described in the description below as unicorn horns. Neil, you're causing chaos, my friend. I'm sorry. 
My point is that you can describe these things because it's just language. It's abstract. So if I insert something abstract into your description, you know, it's like Anthony with his three ice creams. You can't give someone five. On paper, you can, minus two at the end. But if it's something that doesn't even exist in the first place and you're calculating for it, like gravity, in a pseudo dimension, then most people won't cotton on to the fact that you're calculating something that doesn't exist. You've conjured it into reality in the mathematics, but somehow the new science is maths? Well, yeah, because the science has been replaced by things being conjured into reality with maths, and they want those things to be real, or at least at the very least believed to be real by the people they're telling them to with abstract descriptions in mathematics. That's not reality. Physics, that's the physical. That deals with the physical and natural world, as the name suggests. Not maths. That's Absolutely abstract language. Correct. And that's why they go back to math proves things. Yeah. They don't want they want to shy away from the empirical method and say oh, we've got empiricism from mathematics. Yeah, you know, okay, well, does it translate to the physical and natural world? Because it's physics that deals with that. Quantification yeah, is that's... not relevant. Qualification, that's more important. Why does this happen, as opposed to how much of it does it happen when I assume this causes it, when I haven't validated it? So let's worry about how much vinegar is going to make the water boil. And yeah, Nathan, I was thinking uh, yesterday when uh, Sleeping Warrior was saying we, we need to move these people off of the discussion of Newton. I think it kind of ties back to what you were saying, that these are con men at this point, especially the anti-flat earthers. They're con men. They're never going to give up Newton. They're not going to give up Newton. They're not going to give up Einstein. They won't give up quantum uh, uh, reality as well because it gives them an out. As a con man, it gives them an out. They're never going to give it up. Exactly. It's yeah, not agree. surprising to hear. Just, yeah, it's not surprising need... to hear that, that chaos had a, a problem getting, pinning them down to Newton doesn't exist. They won't. Yeah. They need gravity being, being a force. Which with Einstein's mm. gravity, that it's not even a force, it's space and time. They, they couldn't even concede on that. But then later down the road, they want to say, oh, well, gas pushes other gas down because gravity's pulling it and the buoyancy of the gas is pushing it up. It's okay, so gravity is, is your force. How can you hypothesize your force? Uh, how? Hold on, hold on, hold on, so, hold on. That is a bunch of oh, shit. Hold on, sidestepping the fact that gas doesn't go down, go boom, boom. Because that assertion... Right, and I've already explained that to them. The steam goes down. Oh, well, when you put a balloon, when you put a helium balloon in water, and, it, okay, well, now you're doing dealing with different mediums. Like, what, what is your point? There's What are you talking about? Gas displaces gas because gravity's pulling it down and the other gas is more buoyant. Okay, so which gas is more buoyant than the other gas? No, no, which oh, gas is going... Helium's more buoyant No, 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 no. not which gas is... No, no, no. Okay, hold on, so hold on, it... hold on, Sorry. hold on. Not which gas is more buoyant. Which gas is going down, air. go boom, boom, to push the others up? Air. He said air is going down to push the helium up. Oh, really? So air produced in the sky, yeah. right? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I said air is... Uh, all there goes those magical factories in the sky. Level, and they go up. Against gravity. Oh, well, it's displacing. Gravity's pulling the other ones down and pushing the more buoyant ones up. And which ones are those? Yeah, yeah. They can make the assertion. <laughs> but which ones are going down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls poured into a fish tank? Oh, none you of them. You started to say the sulfur hydroxide, whatever. Oh, sulfur hexafluoride and... go down, go boom, boom. No, sulfur hexafluoride <laughs> also fills the availability of volume with entropy. It follows entropic <gasps> law. So, no. Also, sulfur hexafluoride. Hmm, how many sulfur hexafluoride factories are there up in the clouds? Oh, none. It's a man-made gas. So even that gas, when produced by man, was produced on the ground by man. Not produced in magical cloud factories, produced on the ground. And then with entropic law, disperses to fill whatever space it's got. Exactly what I said. Entropic. Entropy. All gases are uh, entropic. So their argument was blown out of the water. They were just beating around the bush, circle jerking me the whole time for three hours. And I was schooling all four of them. They just couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. No, and whoever identified them as con men is correct. It's flat earth. And 
people who are in the anti-flat earth side of this debate are con men. They're no longer fighting for the cause of globe earth because they truly believe in it. They're fighting against it. Saying that you and your reference frames are ruined. That would be the reference frames that the globe earth uses to claim we've got Coriolis effect are ruined. That's the statement of an anti-flat earther. Telling me my reference frames ruined. No, I've destroyed your reference frames. Now they don't exist anymore because we haven't got a globe earth that turns with two reference frames. But I'll be told by an anti-flat earth con man, that's Simon Dan, that my reference frames that I don't claim are ruined. So he's conning the audience into believing that they don't need reference frames and somehow I do and that mine have been debunked when I show that they're debunked. Well, I don't have any. There's only one set and they're being used by Globe to claim you spin, yet you're telling me that mine are debunked when we show that they're not in existence. So that's a con man. You're a, you're a sodding con man, Dan. That's what you are. Con man, Dan. That's a good name. Means confidence man. So you inspire confidence in your victims when you lie and cheat them into believing things that aren't correct. Cheating them into believing that you've debunked the flat earth as reference frames. Well, you con man. You haven't. You've debunked the globe's reference frames when you say they're ruined. And you're going to convince your audience that somehow that's a win for you because you're a con man. Uh, you need to make a video it and title it Con Man Dan. That's a good one. Exactly, Nathan. And, and they're, they're starting to do that with the sextant because they know they're behind it. So they're going to try to pull, they've been trying to pull the, the bait and switch with the sextant as well. That's why uh, our friend Bob uh, had his little uh, teaching moment. They're, they're all con men. They're trying to pull the old switcheroo. Right. Open a box that's got straight lines and level surfaces to acquire angles from. And then when you're not looking, they bait and switch you into... This angle's taken from the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth that I'm now assuming, with infinite star distances, contrary to the angle measurement that was in the suitcase I've just locked up and shoved behind me when you weren't looking. But you're not going to notice that we're working from the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth one degree every 69 miles as I twist this spherical surface that I've now invented without you noticing. Con men. Yeah, Actually, Professor Phil yeah, they... says uh, Sexton wouldn't work on a flat Earth at all. That's the orbital <laughs> mechanics guy, saddle. Well, it only works on a flat Earth. You can't get an angle from a curved surface. You can't create a vort vertices. You need two straight lines for that. It only works on a flat Earth. Actually, it's a presupposed center of a two-dimensional circle, never a sphere. Yep. Yep. Circle of equal altitude. That's two-dimensional, flat. And the line that meets the edge of it at the GP of the star that you're measuring, that's a flat, straight baseline. That can only work. This tool can only work on a flat Earth. Facts. So what are they going to say? It can't work on a flat Earth. Well, uh, where are you going to get an angle from anything that's other than flat? Answer, you can't. It's a prerequisite for measuring a bloody angle. I explained this to my son last night with the black swan and the sexton. Broke it all down for him. And he turned to me and said, y you can't explain two points in the sky. Again, we're putting me on a sphere. And he did give me an answer for the plasma. He said astrophysicists are proving now that the sun is made of plasma. Sorry, did I just drop acid? You said you explained the black swan. That's an argument about the physical limitation of a sphere Earth radius 3959, like the ball Correct. example from that lawyer guy. And then you went on to say, I explained the sextant. That would be two angles, one of them being the flat baseline that you acquire from the horizon and a celestial object. Well, then you said that he explained how the plasma works. Like you've been asking him about plasma. Yeah, he jumped to that. When, his, uh, when he knew he couldn't go anywhere, he went to plasma. Oh, and he said the horizon drops at a certain altitude. I was well, then you can't acquire a baseline from it. Well, if it's dropping away from you, my friend, as it must on a sphere, then you haven't got a straight flat baseline for a sextant. And the horizon is not Earth curve. Right, exactly. Black swan. But you know what? You know what I would have said to that? O.J. Simpson, well, people thought he was guilty when he wasn't guilty. And, you know, law is very much the same as scientific proof, which this black swan modus tollens argument and uh, black swan that goes with it, along with the sextant, which is merely a geometric tool for measuring angles, they're not scientific. And O.J., he got away with it and then didn't. So, you know what I mean? Makes sense in my globe-believing mind. 
The other thing as well, Neil, is that um, Dr. Pierre Robitaille claims that the sun has got a surface, uh, a solid surface. So if it's if Pierre Robitaille says that it's a solid surface and other parts of science say that it's a glaciers plasma, then they don't know what the sun is, regardless of who's, of who's right. So if you look up Pierre Robitaille, you'll see that his articles all describe the surface of the sun having a solid surface because he says spectroscopy, right? Rightly or wrongly, doesn't matter. They don't know what the sun is. No, they do not. That's what I said. Yeah, and you can spend all day trying to argue that Robitaille's wrong. Well, he's no more right or wrong than the heliocentric claim of a violation of natural law. Remind me, but did anybody ever get to the sun and take samples? Yeah, Icarus. No. <laughs> Icarus didn't get there. He got his mil wings melted before he got there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Damn, he nearly did it, though. He got closer than anybody, so we can think that he got there. That's one way of getting around your misunderstanding of the story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's just called a just so story, right? Have you know, I know Icarus. My wife's tennis partner's former cleaner's brother in law went to school with him. My cousin knows Alec Baldwin. Doesn't go that far. Yeah. You can see how quickly it descends into farcical, right? Just it's like that. It's like like they always say when they um you know when um that Jim Carrey movie, what was it called? Because there's, only, cause there's yeah. only one or two Jim Carrey movies, isn't there? <laughs> that, that one, I can't remember what it's called. Talking the one about the like, one where they all were watching him since a baby? Yeah, well, when he's, when he's in the boat and he, and he goes off to the horizon and then it peeks through and he's like, what? And he goes up to it and he pokes it and he realises the horizon is the edge and he's like, what the hell? Pokes his head through and he's looking at the other side. I watched that in the cinema and when that uh, pole smacked into the dome that is the set... Like you say, it's 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 painted like a set, so it looks like the horizon, tricking you as an audience member because you're so used to seeing backdrops that when he smacks into it, the cinema had a particularly good system and the subwoofer was really loud. He made a really big bang when it went in, really deep, loud bang. And I was kind of, you know, it's a kind of tranquil scene. He's floating out, there's nothing happening, there's no music, he's just hearing the sounds of the sea, it's all very relaxing. So you kind of, you know, you're kind of chilling out to it and then boom! You're like, whoa, what was that? And then he goes off and does his Jesus pose in front of the door, doesn't he? Does, does his stance in a crucifix shape. Yeah, back in the There's day. a lot of meanings in that movie. Yeah, I know. What was that movie called? The Truman Show. Yeah, Truman Show, that's it. Yeah, there's Just lots Nathan of... to bring it back to sub, sub harmonics and sound and... Gotta go to sound. <laughs> hey, Nathan, um, I've got four slides to go over on the previous subject of the sextant in Master B. Okay. I'm ready whenever you are. You see the one with the circle, the first one? Yeah, I can put that one up first. Okay. On. Yeah, perfect. All right. Explain how to calculate the position of your vessel by using a vertical sextant angle and a bearing. The boat position can be determined from a distance to the landmark, circle of position, vertical sextant, and a bearing, hand bearing compass. So basically, this can be done with something that's on shore and you're in the water with a vertical sextant angle, or you're in the open ocean and you're using a star or sun and uh, you get the GP. So in this case, it's a lighthouse on shore, but you can also put the sun's GP there in the middle. It doesn't matter because you're holding the sextant vertically. So you have a circle of position. You have a radius from the center of the circle to every part of the circle. So anywhere on that circle, you would have the same measurement of degrees holding the sextant. The azimuth is your bearing starting from north in a clockwise motion so that you know which direction to go. Next slide. Well, that circle of equal altitude that's been up for grabs on the baller side is uh, the one to the left. They're saying it's the one to the left that has that 90 degree symbol box, but it actually doesn't represent 90 degrees, which is the one on the right with the green check mark. See, in triangulation and triangles, you gotta have three straight lines and the 90 degree of a right angle triangle must be there to have a vertical sextant angle so it's up to the audience now to figure out is that bottom baseline curved and if it is why do they always put the box over there under the zenith of the star hmm. when you put that box underneath and it says 90 that means that baseline is straight horizontal flat 
you need that. Okay, so you can make up your mind which one of these is true. Next slide. Here's the sun, and it's at different elevations throughout the day. Okay, so if it's directly above you, it's at your zenith. That would be a 90 degree. If it's look to the very right, early morning, the sun is rising in the horizon, so it has a zero angle. Mid-morning, the sun is getting higher. It's an acute angle. Revisiting 90 degrees in zenith when it's directly overhead. And then in the afternoon, the sun is setting lower, an obtuse angle. And evening time, the sun is ready to set a very obtuse angle, almost 180 straight angle. This is very easy to understand. Last slide. Observed altitude from the sextant. So there's the sun. It's somewhere off over the ocean. It's got a GP where it's directly overhead. It's got its 90 to the earth. That's a zenith. That's a straight line, straight down. You're over here on the left, and there's the vertex. The baseline of that triangle meeting you and holding the sextant must have that flat baseline in order to have that 32 degrees reading on the sextant. But I particularly like this slide because there's a line over you because that's your zenith. See, it's hard to know what your vertical is without a baseline. But if you can shoot the sun and have a baseline to its GP, it can give you a 32 degree angle from your position. So if we measure the altitude of the sun at 32 degrees, how far are we from the GP of the sun? Well, 90, see that straight line above you? That's your 90, right? Minus 32 equals 58. 58 times 60 nautical miles, you're 34, 80 nautical miles away. That's the co-altitude. See, the zenith over you creates the co-altitude. The other one creates the altitude. It is over for these guys. You cannot use the sextant on the globe. It's year 2021, and as Quantum Eraser says it, it's the age of the sextant. Thank you. Epic. Hey, it's good. over. Really good presentation. Thank you. So, so concise, the way you explain it. And as you're watching it, it's like, Jeez, why are they not getting it? Are you on your Yeti? I am. Can you turn the, the gain down a little bit or back off it a couple of inches? You're just you're clipping the okay. preamp a little bit. Um, you know what? I lean forward to see the screen, so I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I lean forward when I get excited. Yeah, if you keep the argument, if you keep the argument to sextant and just the sextant, it's over. They want to now take us to all these different things. I just want to stay on the sextant because it's an angle measuring device and it can't work on the curved surface. Right there. Just keep it right there. I was watching Mitchell the other day and um, Mr. Sensitive brought up a counter argument and he was using the, uh, the, the phrase, instead of using triangulation, he was using trilateration. And um, I don't know why he brought this up, because it's like he didn't think that uh, Mitchell would go and look into it. But Rich, M Mitchell from Australia looked into what trilateration was, and he defined it or described it or explained it as the um, the distances that are being measured rather than the the angles that are being measured, which makes you beg the question, well, makes you ask the question, why would Mr. Sensitive bring this up as a counter-argument? Presumably knowing he'd go and look into it, it makes him look stupid. Uh, it's because he's a con man, like Simon Dan, otherwise known as Con Man Dan. They need to convince their audience that you're doing something that you're not. In this case, trilateration, when the sextant, when used to navigate, is using triangulation. We covered this yesterday, right at the end of the show, or Tenth Man did. I just think it's interesting that he would bring up an argument that he knows Mitchell will go and look into. Because let, let's be honest, if he didn't know about it, he now does know about it. And it's the opposite of what he needs. Because it's not the distances that are in question, it's the angles. And that 90 is a bit of an issue. The one that they don't have anymore, if it's a sphere. So it's like, yeah, that's not, that's not a good rebuttal sensitive. Let's see what he does now to respond to that. Because he's got to admit that tri trilateration is incorrect. Why would you bring it up in the first place? He's never going to do it, though. A con man. Deceived all his audience into thinking something's possible or as a suitable explanation when it's not. Is he going to apologize for misleading his audience? No. No, he'll leave the video up with the incorrect assertion that it's trilateration instead of triangulation when you're measuring an angle to acquire the distance by way of a triangle. 
that'd be triangulation, and say, we don't need it, we just need the distance, and the 90 degree angle that would only be acquirable on a flat earth then doesn't have to be talked about, and he can just ignore Mitchell, leave that video up, and jobs are good, and he's successfully deceived his audience as a con man. Can you explain what con man means again? Confidence man. Watch the film uh, Matchstick Men, Nick Cage, and Matchstick Men explains precisely what a con man is. So they do long cons. That would be to say that they go through a process of acquiring the trust of their mark and then extorting money from their mark. And the whole film is based around him finding his long-lost daughter and throughout the film they're going around with him teaching her how to do cons and in the end it turns out she's not his daughter. She was just there to get a few passwords out of him at a key moment when he was at his weakest and he gave them all because he thought he was dying and it turns out he wasn't. He wasn't in a hospital. It was all just a big long con and he lost all of his money that he conned out of everybody else. But in that film it shows the bait and switch con. Now the bait and switch is where somebody's being convinced that they're changing money by way of currency exchange and making a huge amount of profit of just changing money. So they do it once and the mark brings $1,000 and they give him a real 10000 back for easy numbers. And then he does it a second time, but he wants to do a bit more, so he brings in five grand. And they're like, we'll do it with a different currency this time. It'll get you 20 grand. So they literally give him 20 grand. But then when he says, I want to do the big one this time, I want to give 100 grand, right? When they do that exchange, they show him the suitcase with 100 grand and the girl that's there the daughter, causes a commotion in the airport lounge or wherever it is they're doing this meeting, at which point he shuts the suitcase, puts it behind him and grabs a different suitcase and just as he's turning back around he shuts the suitcase and locks it and says we better get out of here, there's a commotion going on. Hands over the suitcase and they part company. The guy delighted that he's got his hundred grand. No he hasn't. He's lost 10 grand or whatever it was. I've forgotten the numbers that I use now. But that's the bait and switch con. So show a suitcase that's got refraction in it. Light bending, right? Yeah, I can show that. Look at my fish tank example. Light bends. Yeah? Then cause a little commotion. Shut that suitcase. Open another one that's got 7 over 6R in it. And just as they look back, you close the suitcase and say, now we know that we've got refraction, it's light bending around a sphere because I've closed the suitcase on something you thought you'd got, which was light refracting. What we've actually bait and switched you with is light bending around sphere-shaped air at a rate of R. You didn't know that was in the suitcase, did you? But I've closed it when you weren't looking. Bait and switch. That's a good analogy. Matchstick, man. Check it out. That's sort of like The Sting, right? The movie from the 70s with Robert Redford and um, what's his name? Paul Newman. There's a lot of movie about long cons, for example, Oceans, the Ocean series, Oceans 11, etc. Well, that's normally about one or two long cons, as opposed to the long con and the people who are confidence men, the ones that gain the trust and confidence of the people that they're trying to manipulate and con. Well, these are the people we're dealing with in anti-flat earth. They're con men. Of course, they'll project that straight onto us. They'll tell their audiences how we are con men. That's all they do, all day long. I saw a brilliant movie like that the other day with Will Smith and Margot Robbie called Focus. That oh, yeah, that brilliant. was good. Go on, got 60 seconds. Or don't, just leave the dead air after mentioning the movie. Just leave it out there, man, I would. Okie dokie, then. Well, thank you for that. Will Smith movies. Love it. It was a good con getting... movie. As a matter of fact, he gets shot at the end by his own father. Will Smith gets shot at the end. Oh, it sounds great. Uh, but it wasn't Neil. a mortal wound. He was shot in the perfect spot. Neil, we, don't give it all away. It. It's a good we movie. Give you a chance to explain it. You left it hanging out there. Yeah, man, don't leave us hanging without spoiling the movie completely. What's your problem?
Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they're live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by Sleeping Warrior, Tenth Man, Neil, the Adam Meakin, Refracted Curvature and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome one and all. Good morning, good morning. Afternoon, hey, everyone. Good morning. Yo, yo. Good morning. Good to have you all. I'll just say a quick hello to Arwen and then we'll kick off with some housekeeping questions. Hello, Arwen. Hello. Hello, good, good to have you. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as the curve of the Earth? No. No. Wow, that was quick considering the last two shows in a row we've spent 40 straight minutes on that question. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth based variety? No. 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 Nah. That's why it was quick, because we spent 40 minutes the last two shows on it. Okay, you and your reference frames have been ruined. Any evidence of the distance what? to the sun? No. Uh, no. Three Arwinian units, that's it. Arwinian units? Arbitrarily assigned units of distance that are based on rainbow distances from memory? No, it's apparent distances, get it right. It's not actual distances. Bit quiet. You some way away from your mic or something? It's apparent distances, not actual distances. Okay, okay, thank distances. you. <laughs> I didn't need you on top of it. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yes, one extreme to the other isn't going to help either. But thank you. Any scientific evidence of gravity? No. Nope. I got Coffee House saying. If there's a relationship between the weight of objects and the force required to keep them apart. Force required to keep them apart? Oh, no, 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 this is new. What do you mean, apart? <laughs> so, the, I asked him which gravity. He said the one, the one that repeated test show exists, that there is a relationship between the weight of objects and the force required to keep them apart. Okay. I'm not even entirely sure what what I even read. I'd love to know what the repeated know. tests are. That sounds like experimentation when you're talking about the physical and natural world and you say test. Then contextually, that means experiment. So I'd love to see these experiments, not that they will exist. I'll ask them. Yeah, I'll ask them and I'll let you know. It. Did you say his uh, channel name was Coffee House? Here we go. Yes. Wait for it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, he has no grounds for that statement. Can't you jazz up these jokes a bit? I was doing some research the other day. Um, and did you, I, I actually found out how Moses made coffee. Here did we he go. use his staff? Did Here he use go. his staff or did, did he do it by himself? No, he brews it. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? No. I like son, that, Adam. Not my yet. Son, my son thinks that um, astrophysicists have uh, declared the sun plasma. 
asthma, so what violation of natural law by way of gas not expanding into a space it's got available to it? No, definitely not. Right, molten iron core, any evidence thereof? Uh, no. Gas pressure without a container? Any evidence that you can uh, have that? No. Any evidence of the R value? We're going to make it to the end. I can't believe it. First time, it's Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> no. It exists only in terrestrial refraction formula. So that'd be That's no. That's not evidence. Fair enough. It's well, correct, you could think of it as evidence, but yeah. Does that yeah. conclude the housekeeping? After six minutes, I cannot quite believe it. So we've got a bit of outstanding uh, with Righteous. Did you manage to watch Sleeping Warriors video, Righteous? Yeah. Okay, so you've got a good idea on what the claim was being made versus what you stated to us in terms of my response, go forth and experiment. Can you? Would you suggest that that is or isn't a, a, a representation of what I was suggesting you did, first of all? Right. That's a question. I said, could you go forth and test it if you think that there was an incoherent dielectric accelerative force? Well, he already tested it, but so we just go forward from here. We just accept what he did and we take it from here. Did you get a chance to watch it? Yeah, I scrubbed through it. Somebody posted it in Discord later, I found. Oh, good. So we'll, can we go through it now? I know you can't see it, but if you stick it on the uh, live view, you might be able to watch it at like 10 second delay, right? Or I can That's just two or three. Hangouts. Was that a yes? Right. Hangouts. Yeah, let me turn Skype on. I'll come on the Hangouts. Wait, you guys can see presentations on the Hangouts, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, let me join. i got to turn Skype While on. While he's joining, are we on, Nathan? Yeah, the live view's got it as well, but to save his putting another screen up and potentially getting feedback, we just wait for him to join the Hangout and then we can all see what you're seeing. And the audience has now got on a nice big presentation with Zach's handsome... Silhouette and buoyancy, and here we go. Okay, so uh, uh, this is just, uh, just give a couple of seconds just to get settled into the hangout. Can, we, can you hear us, Righteous? You're on mute in the hangout currently. All right, thanks for that. Okay, I'm good to go. In your own okay, time, so, Anthony, go ahead. So um, I heard what was the conversation in the after show the other day, and I heard you say words that I thought, right, I can del I can test this. Um, I heard Nathan say, go forth and multiple, go forth and science that. And that was the correct response. Um, and I thought, right, I'm going to go and do that. I'm now going to go and do this because 18 months ago, or maybe, no, about I think it was about 10 months ago, maybe 12 months ago, recently, I'd already done this test in the background because Bob had made some claims and I, I thought I can test that. And then I went back to Bob and I said, look, I've done this test and it does not do what you say. Can you show me and support your claim? And nothing then happened. Fast forward a chunk of time, I can't remember exactly. And then I hear you say what you said in the, in the Hangout yesterday. And on screen, I've got Bob's words, which I'm not going to talk about for this demonstration. I'm going to talk about what you said um, because your, your words is what I want to come back to if I can. Let me go to it. Your words were, there might be more variables. And I said, and Nathan said, okay, fine, we can science that because we can. Because you said there might be more variables. And then Nathan said, if electricity, then egg displacement. So your, your suggestion was that there might have been an extra variable that I didn't account for, therefore reducing the claim from an independent variable, the cause of an effect, into a correlation for something that was there, but I didn't realize at the time. And therefore, we need to science it. And that's a legitimate and it's a valid thing that we can test because if there is something there, maybe we can manipulate that specific something. And like you said, keep the relative density the same and we can literally just pass the current through, the charge, the current, the voltage, whatever that descriptive word is. If we flick it on and off to see does it cause any acceleration in any direction, if it's capable of causing an acceleration, we can then either say, yes, there is a factor that I didn't control and I should have done, and it's now a correlative effect, or no, there's not, and I didn't have to control something because it wasn't there in the first place that needed to be controlled. But we can prove one of two statements is either true 
or false. We can, it's either true that the, the, the voltage, current, amperage, whatever, does cause acceleration, or it's true that it does not. So that's why I decided to test. So when I when I will just press play in the background. So when I I got it all rigged up, um, I needed three hands, so I had to switch, put the switch on this little board so that I had somewhere to hold the camera whilst pressing the, the, making the connection. Otherwise, I need another hand. But when I when I flick the switch, I'm expecting to see some kind of movement with respect to the egg and the voltage going through it. Now, what I demonstrated later on in the clip is that when the voltage is on and the light's lit. There's um, uh, what's it called electrolysis, and there's there's um, bubbles coming off one of the contacts, and that proves that there is passing electricity through the solution, and the egg is subjected to that current flow or that voltage or the amperage or whatever word. So when I go back to your words, when, when you said there might be more variables, I just wanted to ask you: Do you accept that the variable that might be suggested that might have been pervading? Do you accept that I tested that variable? And if I did test it, do you accept that it wasn't something that was causing an acceleration? So I couldn't have controlled it, even if it did exist, or it simply doesn't exist and I therefore couldn't control that either. Do you accept either of those two positions based on the evidence? Hold on a sec. All right, um, I had my dad talking during the last part. Do I accept what? Do you accept that if there was the variable there in the first place, it wasn't significant enough for me to control it because it didn't cause any acceleration, so I couldn't control it, or alternatively, it just isn't there at all, and I don't have to control something that's not there. Therefore, we accept the null hypothesis that the charge or current or voltage or amperage or whatever descriptive word that is the claim that there might be a flow an acceleration caused by a flow isn't there. So we can accept that that's not true. Do you agree or disagree with that based on the evidence? Well, from the moment, yeah. From what you showed, yes. Great. I have to go so with this. Go on. So can we can we accept now that there is if there is a, this downwards acceleration bias, it's either so small that it doesn't cause acceleration or it just doesn't exist at all. But it's not the reason why there is a downwards acceleration, and it's not the reason. And relative density is not subject to it. It is comprehensive in itself. It doesn't need any electric current or voltage, and the claim therefore fails unless there's new evidence to support the assertion. Right. Going forward, right? So we got to count this and go forward with accounting this. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that was brilliant. That. I wasn't expecting that. I thought there'd have been some refuta refutation of that some had not done right or some that. But thank you so much for being straight. That's nice to see for once. Right. Once. Hold on. Don't imply you hasn't always been straight. <laughs> That's perfectly acceptable. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to imply that. I didn't mean to imply that. I meant to imply that I thought there was going to be more resistance against the assertion that that that, that is pushed around a lot, that this incoherent well, dielectric just... acceleration thing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, I'm, well, I'm... just accept it. There was no resistance. You turn the electricity on and nothing happened. Nothing. Now, to be fair, Nathan did point out that after I put the salt in at this and then flicked it on and off, it did look like it was moving, but I think it's because it was causing disturbance and it hadn't settled. The, the pressure gradient hadn't settled and it was still finding its level. And I, um, I did think, wonder if somebody would have brought that up, but no one's brought it up. But it, let's just be aware that when, when this egg's bobbing up and down and I flick the power back on, it's still bobbing up and down. It's not come to equilibrium yet. It's not found its level. So it does appear that way, but no one's mentioned it. But I'm just glad that we've been able to progress the matter now. Hopefully, we can say, well, it doesn't do this. It's not powerful enough if it exists at all. And if it doesn't, if it is, if it doesn't exist, then it doesn't exist. Very good. He did actually concede immediately as soon as you brought it up. He said, "Yeah, I've watched the video and moving forward, I accept that." There's, you know, he was conceded before he made. I'm glad you yeah. still summarised the example because the audience can see this in isolation now, which is great. That's it. I wanted the audience to see it. However, I did kind of hope also that, you know, there'd be some sort of challenge to it. But, you know, why would there be? <laughs> it makes sense that there wouldn't be. Thank you, Righteous. Seems like a reasonable guy. Why wouldn't you just go, yeah, well, you've right. shown that it doesn't do anything. What more can I say? I got a question. I got a question for Sleeping Warrior. So when they say it's negligible, if, it, if it's so negligible, and they use that word themselves, the proponents of this, then how do they even spot it if it's negligible when in your test nothing happened? I, 
guess maybe at the microscopic level, there's an argument that Brownian motion might have been influenced slightly. Um, I mean, if you got it down to the microscopic level, maybe there is, but it's not the thing that pervades that separates up from down as it's asserted. And it's not the thing that relative density is dependent on like it's asserted. It, it, it isn't. If it was, then I should be able to flick that switch and the egg would burst out of there and make an obvious movement. But it, it, if it made any movement at all, it's tiny. And therefore, it doesn't pervade. It doesn't cause the up from the down. It doesn't. It, it's just not. It's just not worth dwelling on. It's, yes, it exists. Yes, it's there, but it doesn't pervade. That's the point. So the static charge is so negligible that it doesn't do anything. But we want to throw it in there as a causal agent. Is what they that that side is proposing. Is that right? That was the suggestion, and I wanted to remove it as a potential cause, and I wanted to remove it as the pervading factor, because it isn't. Um, the, the pervading factor is the density of the object relative to the density of the medium, and that causes the acceleration that we mistakenly believe is based on gravity or based on bending space-time. These things, we can test them in the real world. We can comply and adhere to scientific method. It's repeatable, it's observable, it's verifiable. Rachey five zeros has repeated it, got the same results. Everybody watching this video can repeat it, get the same results. It ultimately, how many times do you have to flick the switch before you accept that the switch is what caused the light to come on? Or do you want to say, well, maybe there's somewhere else that's causing it that's between the switch and the light bulb, and it's just correlation. It's not. If, if you flick the switch and the light comes on, then that is the cause of the light being illuminated. And if you didn't flick the switch, the light wouldn't come on. Now, obviously, with the light switch, we know there's a bit more to it. But if there is more to it, we need to support it. Oh, look, there's a wire that connects them. Oh, look, there's flow that comes in. Yeah, we, we understand how electrics works. But when there's nothing more to it and we can't evidence any more to it, why is it that the evidence and Occam's razor can't apply? Why do we have to insist that we need to put maths to this to start explaining it? No, we can demonstrate it. Everybody but Bob. Uh, See, nobody mentioned Bob. Everybody but coffee hose. There you go. <laughs> Which I actually, I got an answer out of him about these tests. He sent a link. I told him that I wasn't going to rummage through his evidence. It was his claim, so state it. And he stated that there have been repeated measurements that show a force is required to keep two objects apart. That force has a consistent-ish relationship to the object's weight and the distance between them. Yeah, that's his claim. Yeah, we know what his claim is. We're yeah, that's his to claim. provide yeah. the tests. So he just repeated the claim rather than providing anything and repeated that there were these tests in existence again. Yeah, yeah, we we knew yes. the claim that, but what he was being charged with by you was to actually produce them. Right. He's also he, substituted he a link that he also, summarized in just that. one more thing. Sorry. He's substituted tests for measurements now? That sounds very much like maths. Measurements of something that must be occurring. We've got to see what's occurring first before we quantify it. But if there's a test, then we've got a qualification of what's actually happening and why it's actually happening. So that's what we need. Uh, not just another claim or the, rep the repetition of his original claim that he said he'd got tests. Now measurements. Okay, well, what are they? Let's see them. What's the issue? Right, he's explaining the cause and effect of, of, of course, that he can't even claim or, or actually measure. He's stating that there's something there that, that isn't there that he can't even put his finger on, and he says that the force is consistent-ish. So it's, it's not relevant to everything. It's only consistent-ish to Sorry, certain cons things. Consistent-ish. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> these people, these con men. <laughs> Sorry, what does, what does consistent mean? <laughs> it's consistent it's, it's always it's always <laughs> like even throughout yeah right. right so when you say consistent ish that would mean it's not even throughout therefore not consistent then right which would mean that his repeated measurements wouldn't are inconsistent be consistent inconsistent then anything <laughs> right so he's got a, a, con a consistent force that's inconsistent Oh, that's really useful. That's that's really great. Where are the tests that he was charged with getting? 
Um, you posted a link. The link is called uh, the uh, Big G Redux, Solving the Mystery of Perplexing Result. And it's just uh, the universal constant of gravitation G, uh, affectionately known as Big G, to distinguish it from little g. <laughs> <laughs> the acceleration due to Earth's gravity is a fundamental constant of nature. Meanwhile, uh, it, clouds. Just... Meanwhile, helium balloons. Meanwhile, things go up. What well, acceleration of the gas go down, go boom, boom towards Earth is a constant. Yeah, that was debunked 107 years ago. Yeah, it's. I didn't read through the entire length. Uh, you know, I told him just to summarize his evidence and. That's what he came up with. But I'm sure if I were to read through this fundamental constant of nature, I would prove that it's not a fundamental constant of nature. No, it isn't. If he's saying that the fundamental constant of nature is that things go down, go boom, boom, gas doesn't go down, go boom, boom. I'm looking at clouds right now. I release a helium balloon, it goes up. So, no, that's not a universal constant. That's why it was superseded by Einstein 107 years ago, almost. I mean, I'm I'm just I'm very fed up with just arguing this point because it's, it's circle jerking completely over and over. They'll say a million different words for the same thing, and it's it means all the same nonsense. So, well, no, no. What, what's actually happened though, Chaos? Is uh, uh, I in the pre-show you said, oh, well, you were trying to argue with them with the gravity thing, and they wouldn't concede. Well, now we're into a position where they need gas to go down, go boom, boom. So what are they using to claim it? Coffee House, the guy you were talking about in the pre-show, the one that wouldn't concede on gravity, now, as predicted, needs to use an assertion that things go down towards the ground, 9.8 metres per second per second, exactly as predicted. Hence, he refused to concede it when you pointed all these things out. Because he needs to appeal to it at a later date. So they cannot possibly concede when they're wrong. Because even though they're wrong, they're still needing to appeal to it as he is appealing to it now and saying he's got tests to prove his claim that there's gravity, and the tests are merely a reassertion of his claim that things go down towards the ground with a constant that is defied by clouds. Well, I like the way they just throw in the oh, word yeah. fundamental. How do they throw in the word fundamental without any backing? Because it's their pseudoscience fundamental. It's got to be fundamental to their pseudoscience. It has to be, or else it blows everything out of proportion. Well, what makes something fundamental is your citations, your tests, repeatability. So let's see it. All right. Yeah. I, I don't even, there's in, in the uh, link that he posted, there was something about portion balance. I, I don't really know anything about that. Um, I would obviously have to read into it, but that, I guess, was the the way that they measured uh, this fundamental force that's required to keep two objects apart. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, th th see, it's a, it's a pseudo force. It doesn't exist, but they got really smart about it. Let's just refer to it as a fundamental force. And every time we get challenged, well, it's just a fundamental aspect of it. This is how things work. And then they go on with their lies. Everybody knows that. <laughs> That's the way they come I don't, across. I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to start to reapproach his claim um, in a way that I, I just trap him. You know, I don't even know. My my brain melted when I started to read that because it just it just makes yeah, no sense I'll to me. I'll tell you why. I don't know. How I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because it, uh, uh, I'll tell you why. Because they whistle past the graveyard when you won. Now you said that at that point, well, they didn't have a response. No, no. At that point, you won. Yeah, they didn't concede because, as I said, they had to appeal to it later. But you won. Now you're saying, well, they continued anyway. Yeah, that makes your brain melt. Or it did for me back in the day. Now it doesn't. I'll happily rattle off and count the number of times I have to re-stress the exact same winning point. I take great pleasure in it. Yeah, sometimes with people like Conspiracy Cats, I've got up to a hundred plus repetitions of the same exact point. With them in cognitive pain, with me just making the same exact point that they can't get around, with them squirming and weaseling trying to get away from it. Now for you, you did it once... 
They whistle past the graveyard, and then later down the line, they start appealing to the exact same thing that they wouldn't concede originally. So he's appealing to a gravitational test. And what's the test? My description of a universal down go boom boom force? That's not a test. It's just your assertion that we've got a unilateral force that doesn't apply to clouds because they're not going down, go boom, boom, and the gas around them isn't forcing them up either. So no, that was debunked 107 years ago, the original point. They wouldn't concede. Yeah, that's why they wouldn't concede it. So round we go, do do -si do here we go. Hold your partner. Back to gravity again. Oh, why? Oh, didn't we debunk this 10 minutes ago? Yeah, let's start counting off how many times I have to point out the gas don't go down, go boom, boom. Round your partner, skip to the loo. Don't worry, Nathan, I'll handle it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You've got nothing to handle. You're you're fine. You're not going to lose any sleep over this either. You know, unless you oh, frustrate absolutely. yourself with the fact that they won't concede. That's their cognitive pain. That's where, that's where you're at. You need to start recognising what is their cognitive pain. When you're going, it fries my brain that I've debunked it, and then you can't get them to concede. You carry on five minutes with a conversation, and then they're back to appealing to something they haven't proved, and has been debunked. It melts your brain, you said. Nah. That's their cognitive pain. Point it out to them. They will, I absolutely assure you, project it straight onto you. They'll tell you you're in pain and that you've lost the argument. Yeah, understand and recognise what's actually occurring. These people are mentally tortured. Now, when we get various updates about the fundamentalist religious zealots on the anti-flat earth side of this argument, they tell us about how stressful it is and they need time off from it. It's that stressful. Yeah, that's yeah, actually he's, something he's... Uh, me and Righteous were talking about. Um, like, well, what's my end game here? You know, did you know what am I trying to get out of these people when I explain these things to them? And I, I, I think I've I've just been struggling it because I really want them to go, okay, you win, and I go, oh shit, yeah, you, you know I did, you know, but I, I don't, I believe that I don't see it that way anymore because I'm just gonna hit them with the facts and it's all on them. You know, yeah. I did my job and that's it. You know, I, I won just by hitting them with the facts. Yeah, don't fret it. When they won't concede, they're left with a position that's been debunked, how it's been debunked, and their original belief that they want to cling on to. That's described as cognitive dissonance. Well, that's a pain that they have to su suffer the burden of. It's not your burden. They'll project it onto you, but don't don't suffer their burden. The, the cognitive pain is so strong in these people... And it's very simple litmus test, right at the beginning. I did it last week. I, I always do this. Can you define a straight versus a curved line? When they can't do that, they're living with the pain, not you. Can we come up with that phrase, share your pain? Yeah, this is why. Yeah, like I say, we get various updates from people. And we go, where did that guy disappear to? And then they'll come back and say, yeah, I just couldn't cope with the stress of it. It was doing my head in. I couldn't cope. So I had to get away from it for a while. And you're like, yeah. That get, away from, get, get away from what? I don't feel like I need to get away from anything. I do this daily. Does it leave me stressed? Do I lose sleep over it? Do I? Hell, no, I do not. I do worry about not earning enough money. I'll be honest. Smash the Super Chat and PayPal link. I've got a bill on the way. I keep telling people. <laughs> but yeah, that's about the only stress I suffer. I'm not a big enough YouTuber to support myself, which means e-begging, which is embarrassing. But other than that, that's about the only real stress of doing this. I don't go away going, oh no, they told me after I pointed out that they haven't got an R value that you're going to have to assume a globe to get a straight line, baseline to do an angle measurement with a sextant. They just said you're going to need a globe for that. No, I, I recognise what's occurring. Yeah, they're imitating us. All right, why? Well, I take that as a compliment. Highest form of flattery, in fact. But is that you're going to need a globe for that attached to a devastating argument that I'm losing, losing sleep over? Oh, absolutely not. Just a baseless assertion and done with lots of people saying it. Why? Well, because our devastating argument, Black Swan, with us saying you're going to need R from that, for that, yeah, we all got together at the behest of Mitchell to say you're going to need R from that, and in some cases he edited it out of videos. Well, you're going to need R for that has a devastating argument attached. When they just say you're going to need a globe for that, that is literally just them chanting that you're going to need a globe for that. Because there's no argument attached to that. It's just chanting. 
the thing is when they do do that you're going to need a globe for that 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 our rebuttal still applies to their rebuttal you're going to need an r for a globe so when they say you're going to need a globe for that yeah he's still going to need an r value for the globe morons so it isn't it's not rebutting our rebuttal it's just like nathan says it is chanting because it's ignoring the, the the requirement we're asking them to prove that's like their dumb housekeeping questions that we destroyed the day they came out with them bunch of morons yeah. What will you need a globe for? I'm sorry, I missed I missed the first part of this. What, what will you be needing a globe for? Triangulation. Sextant use, apparently, according to these dickheads, is requirement or is a, an antecedent consequent relationship that needs a globe. Something that literally is one of the few things that you could not do this on. You couldn't acquire a baseline from it. Yeah, it's just chanting. Never mind. It is just chanting. You're going to need a globe for that, will we? No, no. Every description ever describes how you get a 90 degree to a triangle that you're making with a celestial item and a baseline. That's two straight lines. That's flat earth. Circle, two-dimensional, of equal altitude. Area of equal elevation. Yeah, these things aren't pointing towards curved surfaces moving away from you at 8 inches per mile squared. Quite the contrary, in fact. If you had that, it wouldn't work anymore. So... Rather than you're going to need a globe for that, no, you're going to need two straight lines for it. It's an angle measuring device. But maybe you could chant it some more. Maybe get a few more fundies. Maybe get bigger names to chant that you're going to need a globe for that use of a sextant. Because that's really going to cost me some sleep. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's been terrible. I've been tossing and turning over, you're going to need a globe for that rebuttal. I mean, I really have been losing sleep over this. I'm sure you all agree. <laughs> it's the best thing they ever said. I'm still laughing. Isn't that akin to, like, when the kid pointed out the emperor had no clothes on, the emperor going, well, you're naked too. Yeah, it is just childish. It's a childish way of saying... No, 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 need an R for that. Well, you're going to need a globe for that. It is absolutely pathetic. The fact that they're doing this in unison makes it chanting. Chanting a baseless assertion together doesn't mean you've got a devastating rebuttal attached to it. What you have got is a presupposition that the angle you take from the surface is moved to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth when you bait and switch how it's done with how you will qualify it on a sphere when you beg the question that the angle's from the centre. Well, that's not how a sextant works very literally, is not what you do. One, one, one correction. On a circle, not a sphere. Because all it is is, a, is an orthographic view of a circle that they show in those pictures with a cent central angle. They need the vertex. They need it to meet somewhere. They can't do it on the surface. No, where can we... How can we use the circle to represent the sphere and get our angles? I can't do it on the surface. Hey, let's take it to the middle and have it meet there. Yeah, but we're on the surface with the section. Yeah, but we'll switch that around. We're really doing it from the middle. <laughs> Sextants used to measure an angle on the surface with a straight flat baseline to the horizon and beyond to the GP of whatever star you're measuring so you can perform triangulation. That is its purpose. Now, when we point out that to do that triangulation with a triangle, with two straight lines meeting at a vertex at your feet on the surface of Earth, that is not to say that you're going to need to transpose that to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth. That's my rebuttal to you're going to need a globe for that. No, you're going to need to transpose an angle measurement that you take on the surface to the centre of your begging the question fallacy that you're on a spherical surface that wouldn't allow you to measure the angle you took from the surface to then move to the centre of a presupposed spherical earth. We definitely don't have. We've debunked the R value you're moving it to with the black swan. So you don't have an R value to actually move this to your presuppositional centre of a presupposed spherical earth after you've measured it on the surface which is flat. Earth is obviously, observably, navigatably and measurably flat. I'd like to get Brian and Adam Meekin to comment on this since they were leading this charge. If you're actually taking it from the center, then you got to do dip correction for 3,959 miles, not 14 feet. Hey, everyone. Well, what's the point in doing dip correction on a globe? Like, if you're going to go to the center of it. 
it's complete and utterly brainless. You know, the, their dip correction happens from the bow of the boat when the horizon mirror is tilted towards the horizon. That's what they think dip correction is. It, you know, it's not. It's that after you do that, which is your initial angle, you then you then make it a, a, a right angle triangle by making the base horizontal, by bringing the vertex from your eye line down to the surface of the water underneath your boat. But they, they, what they do is they, they talk about the initial angle, which is the horizon mirror pointing towards the horizon. And then obviously you have the, the uh, index mirror. Uh, bringing the uh, celestial object down to that. Um, but then they try and do the horizon dip correction as you dipping your horizon mirror down to the horizon a second time. It's like you're already dipping it down to the horizon. I think what they're trying to do is actually dip it down further to where a geometric horizon would be. I think that's kind of what they're talking about. It's it's crazy. It's, abso it's absolutely crazy. That's all I could call it. That is what they're doing. That's precisely what they're doing, Brian. They actually, or they, he, that would be uh, Bob, asserted precisely that. Bob the science guy said, yes, we are indeed pointing down towards the geometric horizon. That's where they're acquiring their claim of a dip. No, 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 no. That's all, as you correctly identified already, from the centre of a presupposed spherical earth making the dip totally irrelevant for their claim but when they actually say well what are you going to point it at well they're going to assume that you've got a geometric horizon and a straight line to it yeah that's the nail so when when they make those apologetics for the dip correction in doing so they make a definitive statement that the horizon is the leading edge of a ball okay yeah because that's why you're pointing it to it and adjusting for it on a ball well then yep. the answer to that is black swan exactly that's where i had virus he was the first to fall victim to it and i had him absolutely over the barrel on it what's that you say straight line to the dip horizon that you've got on a globe now black swan bitch actually that's exactly how you said it too yeah well, what about the black swan? I've got no problem with the black swan. What, the thing that debunked your physical geometric horizon? Oh, dear. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. You're going to appeal to that debunked geometric horizon now that used to be claimed to be blocking things, then was claimed to never be seen, but now is in requirement for your geometric assumptions from the centre of a presupposed spherical earth with what you're claiming as dip? Oh, no, 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 no. No, we've debunked that with the black swan. It's only been 22 months. Did you think by denying it with refraction, saying you haven't got one and don't need one because of refraction, would mean that 22 months later you could appeal to it for the sextant? Oh, no, that'll get you what Virus had. Yeah, called a bitch and told the black swan is actually real. Calling it refracted also annihilates this position for your sextant claim. When you move it to the centre of a presupposed spherical earth rather than the angle measurement on the surface, yeah, it's a complete annihilation. Yeah, year of the sextant? No, 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 age of the sextant. You're going nowhere. The globe's so dead and buried, and you've got nowhere to go. Well, you're going to appeal to some geometry that you denied for 22 months? I think not. It's another double dip, isn't it? I, I, I can't remember what it was that you used to call the, the double dip, you and Anthony. Uh, I can't remember what that was you used to refer to before. It was before the Black Swan. It was basically, um, I'll just summarise in 30 seconds. The double dip is the assertion that if you're looking through a lens and you do have the very real effect of things getting smaller with, into the distance, hashtag shit shrinks, and you're also asserting that there's an earth curve geometry falling away from your visible vantage point at 8 inches per mile squared, then you'd need to acquire both values, regardless of how, Rayleigh criterion for one perhaps and the other being earth curve, and apply them both. That would be a double dip rather than the single dip. Now, at that point, when we're pointing out that one seems to match what we observe, it's pretty clear that we do definitely have perspective and we definitely don't have Earth curve. Uh, hashtag, nobody's expecting to see Earth curve geometry. 
the geometric horizon only exists in the maths? These are quotes from our opponents. So notwithstanding that we don't have a geometric horizon, where the hell are you going to acquire one for this sextant measurement? Yeah, well, well now they do have a double dip. Uh, then they were. Then they, at that time, they weren't. They weren't comparing the two things. They were only doing something, ignoring perspective and Rayleigh criterion, and just claiming our curve. Uh, whereas now they're doing a dip, the initial dip to the horizon from the bow of a boat to get the initial angle. They're doing a, then they're doing a second dip, which brings them below the real horizon the optical horizon, down to a mathematical, in their own belief, horizon, a geometric horizon. And then they are calculating for that for absolutely no reason, because then they're bringing the angle to the centre of their mathematical globe anyway. It, it just makes absolutely zero sense, because they, they, don't, they don't change the... Like, if I bring... I have to say this. If I bring the... Lens. Uh, if I dip, turn, t tilt down the section so the horizon lens is towards the horizon, and I take an angle, if I then dip the section even further down, then that's going to change the initial angle. If I keep the same, keep if like if I was going to, like like that, did they? How were they bringing the? the celestial object down to meet their geographical a mathematical horizon. How do you bring a, a celestial object down to meet a mathematical horizon? You can't. So the horizon dip correction is completely pointless, crazy nonsense on their globe. Well summarised. Really yeah. But, but uh, to be as well summarised as that is, you know, Adam wins because <laughs> Adam's pointing out where the nail in the coffin comes. As soon as they appeal back to their geometric horizon or to a tangent point based horizon, a Sagittarius based horizon, anything that's got a straight line in it, black swan. Why haven't you been around for the last 22 months when you appeal to geometric straight lines? Regardless if they're pointing down, number one, that's not how the sextant works. You're acquiring a straight baseline. You won't get the 90 degree for what you've just described if you let them assume that it's pointing down when you match it up to their mathematical horizon that only exists in the maths to match the luminary in the lens. No, no, no. At that point, they're not getting 90 degrees. So let's just draw a line under that. They're not doing triangulation anymore. Maybe it's trilateration, right, Mr. Sensible, you fuckwit? Well, I, I actually... Uh, when I spoke about, about this with Adam uh, privately, uh, uh, when well, I say we disagreed, we, we, there wasn't like an, ang a, an angry disagreement. We just had a disagreement. And I disagreed about even bringing up the Black Swan at that point. Uh, I want, I, simply because I know that's what they want to argue about. They don't want to talk about the, the Horizon Dip question. That's the last thing they want to talk about. I, I, so, but Adam said he didn't care. <laughs> I, I understand it, and I think you can see it in your head, the geometry in your head, and that's why it's so powerful. It's just a bugger to actually explain. But when you do see it, it is exactly that ridiculousness. Uh, and it's the similar sort of thing we're describing. The black swan supports it. What you're pointing out is the ridiculousness of it um, with regards to drawing it to that leading edge. If you are drawing it to a leading edge, what are you drawing it to? What is your straight line even for, as is Brian is saying then? It's totally right. It becomes a ridiculous, pointless line. That they haven't gotten the black swan debunked. Yeah. <laughs> but Anthony's just put up the double dip. This is four years ago, man. It's going back a while now, the Isle of Man discussion. But at this point, as I say, we called it the begging the question, perspective exclusive Earth Curve Calculator. Now, that eventually got changed because when you realise that the effect very closely matches up with their mathematics and even the numbers match up at 1.22 times the square root of the observer's height in feet versus 1.2 over wavelength or lambda or whatever it is with the Rayleigh criterion, you know, you've got very similar mathematics. So it's not perspective exclusive. It's not ignoring perspective or leaving it out. It's completely hijacked perspective and called it Earth Curve. 
and then when they need to fudge the numbers, they apply terrestrial refraction through sphere-shaped air and bend the light at a rate of r to make it as flat as possible, when in reality, things get smaller into the distance, and that effect is what they've hijacked. So this is the, the various different illustrations that Anthony was trying to make this point at the time when saying, well, your curve maths is an orthographic view. It absolutely unequivocally excludes the effect of things getting smaller. You've got a feet and inches value for this mountain. And each of these mountains, as Anthony's depicted them, gets smaller into the distance, exactly as we see. Well, their mathematics has it as a 200-foot mountain. And this mountain closest to the guy is 200 foot. And so is this one effectively removing any angular size reduction that would be perspective the fact that it gets smaller as it gets further away well no no this is still 200 feet so the fact that we've got a, an obstruction then claimed to be earth curve that's the only cause well you're like hold on it's got smaller the angle to the bottom of it's reduced towards the deck and therefore has got to the point where you can't see the bottom first because it's the most limited angle so therefore that's earth curve Hold on, what about perspective? You're supposed to include that effect. Nah, they're never going to include it. Muppet vision, justification. It's geometric. Remember those days, lads, when they were told, we were told no perspective required, geometry rules. Until you debunk the geometry. And then it's all refracted. With R that they can't get anymore. Thank you, Anthony. I remember when this first came out. That was so helpful and educational. Loved it. Oh, thank you, Neil. I think you missed a couple of super chats there. I haven't got them on screen to see them. It's my bad. Until I get the projector working, I just I haven't got enough screen real estate to see the chat. I'm so sorry. I'm sure there's been a couple of times in the last few days. Shout out to Godzilla. At least I can read it on the slower resolution. The big screen gives me a nice big text readout. Finally, from the chat comes the globe earth proof we've all been waiting for for years. Ready? Question mark. Effie is stupid. Rest in peace, Effie. Ha, ha, ha. Thank you very much for the super chat, Godzilla. I really appreciate it. Also, Al Junkie, know your position at sea, question mark. You're going to need a star for that with a capital R. <laughs> very good. Also, shout out to Sasha or Unitox Femi. Uh, for cognitive pain, call 03959 blah, blah, blah. Yeah, indeed. I'll give out the helpline for cognitive dissonance laden fundamentalist religious ball believing zealots at the end of the show. There is a help centre available to anybody who needs to share their pain. There isn't really, I'm just joking. Shout out again to Unitox Femi who says, whoever hurts cognitive pain hurts more. No, whatever hurts cognitive pain hurts more. I think he's sort of implying that if you break your leg, the mental anguish of cognitive dissonance is more... I'm going to disagree with you there and say a broken leg's probably more painful, but share your pain all the same. Uh, I think that's probably that's, it. If I've missed anybody, I'm really sorry. I can't see any of the super chats as I'm scrolling up. So if I have missed you, I'm sorry. It's just scrolled off my list. By the way, how was Zinder doing anyway? Did anybody check up on him? <laughs> Zinder was one of the people I was referring to earlier when I said that we were told that he couldn't cope and needed some time off from this very stressful arena that we're all in daily and quite happy. <laughs> Apart from a bit of infighting over maybe Arwen's behaviour or Tenth Man's pointing out of Arwen's behaviour or maybe my e-begging or people not liking it. We've even got a bit of an internal hustle at the moment going on between some of the people who are very prevalent in this subject, namely Russian vids, Jaronism, Dirth, Rich Richie from Boston and High Impact vids. Is there anyone else who's now piled onto that list? Oh, Rob Skeever, I was told this morning by Anthony Riley, was being called out in some respect to 33s and lots and lots of his videography. Um, so there's so much going on internally at the moment that people are stressing on. Notice none of them are, oh no, this great globe proof. <laughs> none of them. Absolutely none. I'd like to so, say Nathan. I, I I started to read that link from uh, Coffee Hose, and in the in the link, it says, "quote There's some small chance that maybe our understanding of gravity is wrong, and there's something slightly different about these experiments that causes the value to be different from other big G experiments, which you, which would be really interesting." I said, "Well, no shite, because they can't prove it at all. It's not a fundamental constant." And here's a kicker. They use Newton's theory. 
Newton didn't have a theory. But, yeah, yeah he keeps referring to these experiments. What, it's fascinating how you're analysing these experiments, but so far all he's done is made a claim, and then when you asked him to provide tests, the original assertion, he came back and described them as measurements, and then reasserted the exact same claim. Then, you, same thing, well, where's the tests, where's the experiments, where's the measurements? And he comes back and says, well, it seems that some people disagree with the experiments. Uh, uh, hello? Just give us the tests you're referring to so we can rip them out of your throat. That's what we're going to do. But you've actually got to cite something rather than these ethereal tests that might or might not be wrong that are open for discussion and how they're being interpreted. What the hell are they? <laughs> right. I think he's logged off, so I don't think I'm going to get any answer out of him for the rest That's of the shocking. day. <laughs> There was me all yeah, full of hope. Trip. I was losing sleep over this. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it was just funny. I just started Boston reading, over and over I don't know, again. Half, not even halfway through it, and they're claiming Newton's uh, theory of gravity. Well, Einstein's already superseded it, so why are they working backwards? Uh, and meanwhile, clouds? Gas not going down, go boom, boom? Uh, sulfur hexafluoride, you say? What, made in the magical sky clouds and going down boom, boom, boom because it's man-made and made on the ground? No, no, none of the gases are made up in the sky going down, go boom, boom. That's why it's been superseded by... Who's doing that from the chat? Don't, don't, go on, Anthony. Me, don't, don't mention that some things go up, Nathan. They can't talk about those, those gases that go up. OK, should I just go on camera and look up at the clouds with a wistful thought in my eye? Nathan, can you can you weigh sulfur hexafluoride when it's not contained? No, it's just subject to entropy, same as everything else, right? You might be able to create a differential. Maybe you could. I don't know, if you dropped a, a scale into a fish tank and then took some contained, so it wasn't filling the space, sulfur hexafluoride, and then maybe put a piece of cardboard over it or something to stop it leaking out when it stopped being contained... And then you just you uh, transferred the gas from the container into the fish tank, another container, and then temporarily removed the cardboard so that you could drop in a scale. Maybe it would show a higher value. I don't know. How would you tear yeah. it? Just tear it outside and then put it in, and then wouldn't that invalidate gas, when you it talk? Can't, it can't be done. It can't be done. Gas doesn't have one single vector. It has every vector, so it's impossible to weigh a gas when it's uncontained. Gas doesn't have weight. Oh, I see. The so convention of weight. I gotcha. So what you're saying is, even if I manage to drop a scale into that fish tank, all I'd be doing is measuring the force, that would be pressure, that was exerted on the scale in a downward vector. However, at the same exact time, there are other sulfur hexafluoride uh, parts that are going up. Yeah, it's going in every every possible vector all the time so you can't weigh it in its natural state any gas regardless of how dense it is once it's in a gaseous state that means it's unbonded and all those uh, independent entities move about in every direction uh, at a high rate so you can't can't weigh it Right. So, it's like I was, to, I was talking with Spurs yesterday or the day before, and a two-liter bottle of pop is all you need to demonstrate that we can't be living in a vacuum of space. Because, like, when you have the top off the bottle, the, the the pop inside goes flat. Why is it that the gas molecules are coming out of that bottle? They're going up. They're not going down, are they? And when you put the lid on, over time, pressure begins to build on the inside. And next time you take the top off, it'll go. Tss. Well, why does it do that? It's because the pressure begins to equal. It uh, pressure begins to build, and then when you release that pressure, because you've got a hole in the top, it it immediately disperses. Well, why doesn't that happen to the Earth in space? Because we've got pressure here. There's supposed to be a vacuum over there. Why is it not doing that? I put that to a, uh, I put that to an anti-flat Earth fund. Do you know what they did? <laughs> Go on. They just denied it was flat. <laughs> Well, I got it. Oh, flat I got it. <laughs> well, uh, they, they did a test um, back back to like the, the fish tank and, and putting a scale in. They, uh, you know, when they have underground tunnels uh, or underwater tunnels um, that boats travel over, they wanted to see if the boat displacing the water, the water would push down and cause, you know, pressure on the tunnel. 
and it, it doesn't. So even even like you said, the vec the uh, displacement vectors are, are in all directions, but it it has no actual impact on on the weight uh, from the boat and the water pushing down on it. So even still, there's there's no weight, no no nothing. Sure, but in, in but to speak to what Brian has sort of qualified that with or re responded to that with is just to say that when you've got something that's travelling in all vectors, to say, well, what's the weight of it? Well, what is weight? Well, you're qualifying something as having a downward vector immediately. Well, okay, you, if you if you could show a reading, it's like, well, what, what about the one that's moving away from it? You know, the, its behaviour by its nature defies it being weighed. That's the point that Brian's making. Yeah, if you... Okay. Yeah, I understand. If you surround a weighing scales with sulfur hexafluoride, as soon as you put uh, any solid or any liquid at all and you drop it onto that scales, it's going to weigh the, it's going to weigh the object or the substance, whether it be liquid, like a drop of water, uh, if it's a small scale, or, or a normal size scale, like it'll weigh a coffee cup, a brick, whatever. But it, oh, and the same thing if, uh, if people are using water, uh, you, there, nothing has weight uh, unless it has a singular downward vector. Gas doesn't have that. So because gas, gas doesn't have that, you can't claim gas has weight. You can put it into a container and weigh it with the container and then weigh the container without it. And because gas has substance, and it has, I suppose you could call it magnitude, magnitude. It, like, you could weigh the container with the gas inside of it, which is adding more density to the container. That's what you're doing. You're adding density to something that was empty. Now you're adding gas in, uh, a, a high concentration of gas in, that's more concentrated than the air that would have been in the container. So you're adding density to the internals of the container, and then you can weigh that. But in its natural state, it can't be weighed. And the absolute killer, and I don't know why, I just don't know why more people aren't get, taking this on board. The absolute killer for a force of gravity is that objects in a vacuum weigh more. For them and their claim, objects in a vacuum has to weigh less for a force of gravity. Not Einstein's relativity now, but a force of gravity. For that to exist, as they say, then the air has to have a downward weight. And they claim it has, and that's what, how they have a, their pressure gradient throughout the, their atmosphere, is through gravity giving weight to the gases. Meanwhile, gas does not go down, go boom, boom. But with that, I'm going to say, if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. A huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. I've been Nathan Oakley. Stay tuned if you're watching on a premiering stream once again. I will see you all in the next video. Right. Yeah, about I I'm back by the way, but about the the gas uh, yep. going down in a vacuum and all that, it's really weird because according to the ballers, uh, or not according to the ballers, but more regularly. The more gas pressure there even is, the less weight something has that is also gas, effectively. So gas pressure kind of takes away the, the assumption of gravity pulling it down, right? Now, they can justify gas in a balloon going down 
in a vacuum, they can't justify how it acts when it's not in a vacuum, though. And that's why they draw that example in to supposedly prove gravity, but they never use any demonstration in which there is gas already present in the room. <laughs> Yeah, they yeah, kind of try exactly. and assume existing gas pressure and then go to the delta, basically. Yeah, correct. The, the, the rebuttal I get, and I've gotten, uh, since I, I have made a, that short video about how, how uh, objects weigh more in a vacuum, the only rebuttal they can give me, right, which is a big in the question, circular argument rebuttal, and a pointless rebuttal is buoyancy, right? Now, I just want to state for the audience, buoyancy is, the, is Archimedes' principle. It has absolutely nothing to do with a force of gravity. It was around a long time before anyone came up with any ideas about gravity. And buoyancy is a displacement. And it's a displacement in their, in their claim. It's a displacement up the way. So they're claiming an up. They need it down. So they're claiming when they claim when when I say to them that objects weigh more in a vacuum, that means there is no force of gravity giving weight to the air like they're supposed to be for their pressure gradient. They claim buoyancy, which is an up. So is there an upward force now causing a downward pressure? You know what I mean? It's complete and utter rubbish. It's like that's their only rebuttal, buoyancy. And when as soon as they say that, all I write to them is, well, say goodbye then to your pressure gradient. Indeed. Right. Well, their buoyancy, assuming gravity, assumes that it will just float on top Right, but it's still going down, go boom, boom. So yep. their entire system always was about fuzzying up the difference between liquid and, and gas. And that's why they like to call it a fluid, because they want you to envision that liquid dynamics of, of forming layers, right? And yeah, gas doesn't really do that. It expands in all directions and that doesn't really fit their conception. You ain't kidding, Arwen, because what somebody told my son in 24-7 that clouds and gas are in layers, oh, he was ecstatic. Right, all these columns of air pressing down to the ball earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that's another thing. When they say anything about columns of air, they don't know what they're talking about. What they're referring to there is what's known as thermal columns. And thermal columns is like localized, more localized convection, which is an up and a down, a circular, a circular uh, a cycle of uh, warmer and colder gas. Right. So it's, it's turbulence based, right? It's just like you take an aquarium full of very cold water and then you pour in hot water. It's going to, well, sort of like form a tube at first. Or was it the other way around, cold and hot? But anyway, there's just turbulence dynamics. And because it's a, a dynamic system, that just happens. But it has yeah, nothing yeah. to do with the nature of it, basically, uh, how it settles on Earth. It's yeah, because it's the, moving the that problem, happens. The problem is, when, it, when he's on his show and I'm trying to bring him to an understanding of flat earth and a flat earth is telling him that it's layers and columns of gas that's not good because he throws it up in my face all the time even one of your flat earthers said gas is in layers yeah it's, well the way that they describe it on theirs with atmospheric pressure is columns of air but that needs correcting because they're not columns of air because the pressure presses on you in all directions all the way around you including up your hoop so it's like it's not a column pressing down. It's 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 omnidirectional in all directions, all around you. Like imagine that you were to do um, what's it called, uh, an aura, and you were to draw somebody's aura, and you draw draw it as like spikes all the way around you in three hundred and sixty. That's the way that the gas molecules are hitting you, creating the pressure. So a column down is totally wrong. It's all around you in all directions. This 
seem to always take something that's a reality or something official, like column, like thermal columns. And the reason they're called thermal columns is because they work in a cycle. So the warmer air rises while the cooler air replaces it. And this is kind of what happens. This is how it's described. This is how they describe it, meteorologists. That's how they describe it. So they seem to always take something like that, whether it be something that's a visual thing or something that's a, a description of effects, and they just take a word or some part of it, and it becomes the globe. It's hijacking. They just hijack everything. It's not just perspective. It's a hijack of a hijack of reality. Oh, so, are you, so are you saying that their arguments are full of hot air? Yeah, but I would not. It's more like bypassing reality, right? Because all these air based in the gradient and columns, all these effects are secondary to gas having filled the available space and then forming a gradient, Precisely. creating a column because of the heat. So they constantly bypass the original antecedent and then just start to imagine that the result of the gas already having filled the container is somehow proof of it not needing to fill a container. Exactly. So they just bypass exactly. it. They, they immediately appeal to having the antecedent that would be gas pressure in the first place to any example. In other words, they just sidestep. Where'd you get the gas pressure in the first place? Right, and you can demonstrate sort of, that all these effects, the columns, the gradient, that can't form if, if, they're, if, if you basically, you, can, you can't form those things in a vacuum chamber. The gas will escape. None of those things will form that way. And they just ignore that fact. So basically you're saying it can never form if you have a vacuum of space next to the gases, it would have to disperse in all directions. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what that video No columns of air, no dynamic system, no gradient, nothing like that can form without the gas being contained and settling first. That's what that video shows with the bromine gas. First off, they show it in, in the vacuum and it goes bang straight away. And then the second part of it shows it gradually, slowly meandering its way through. And that's because there's already air in there, right? So it's got resistance against it to stop it from immediately bursting. But you still need the container to create that resistance. When there is no resistance, it fills it immediately. That debunks the globe earth theory. Yeah, diffusion. Uh, 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 yeah, as opposed to gas expanding into a vacuum, simplest form of entropy in, you can show, right? No, no other incurrence. When you've got diffusion... It's like when somebody had an example recently when they were saying, well, I open the door on my bathroom after I've had a shower, and what I see is the steam is almost hanging there. It's not making its way immediately. It's not like expanding massively into the space. It's like, yeah, because there's other stuff in the way. In the same way for a small amount of time, you can have sulfur hexafluoride with it in a high concentration. It's still going to suffer the entropic effect. The fact that there's already in existence gas above it, yeah, it doesn't mean that that gas forms layers. It means there's just merely a high concentration that man has managed to induce in that time. Likewise, you open the door on a bathroom, the steam doesn't just pile in, it doesn't explode in your face from the bathroom. You open the door and see a whole load of steam in the room. Well, that's because you're still in existent air that's bashing its way constantly because it's moving in all vectors against the steam that's in the bathroom. But over time, it diffuses into the existing air. That's gas behavior. Anyway... Yeah, you know, I mean, that, it's uh, even I try to example. Sorry, wait, 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 say one thing that, like, if you got a golf ball inside of a large uh, vacuum, and let's say this golf ball had the gravitational pull that they proposed, and it was holding gas molecules down. Not only are they proposing that it holds it in uh, in in lock and in the vacuum, they're also saying that this ball is moving through different vectors of space in that vacuum, also. So it's spinning and moving in an elliptical path inside of this vacuum, as well as holding things down. And spinning them around with the with the uh, celestial objects, giving the illusion that it's not moving for us, what we experience on Earth. How bizarre is that? You're gonna need that for that. Yeah, you're gonna need that for that. 
Sorry? You're gonna need half of that. <laughs> Fucking R value. I still I've still been asking the Globers where the R value is for a while now. They still can't come forward and say this is how we this is how we measured or how we determine the you know the radius value. And they just oh they just put it into all these calculations, but no one knows where it came from. It's just an assumption and it's just like so funny. Nathan, do you remember where we realised where that where it actually came from originally? Do you remember the first admission of where it comes from? First admission. Yeah, Mick West, wasn't it? Where did you get R from? And he just and you assume it. It's just in the maths, isn't it? And you assume it, Mick, right? And he goes, yeah. He was the first big name to admit that they just begged the question, that they just assume it in the maths. We already knew it. It's in the title. Earth curve calculator. Well, yeah, it's already being assumed. But to tie them down on what the base of the assumption is, that would be R. Mick West was the first. Now they, you know, they have to run away from R. Back then, they hadn't even admitted that they're begging the question by using it. Oh, how the tables have turned over time, eh? Well, yeah, I'm surprised completely. that Mick West at the time didn't even bring up Al Baruni or anything. Didn't even try that. I don't think he knows who he is. Really? Yeah, I huh. don't believe he knows who he is. Maybe. Yeah, They're because odd, though. Nobody knows. I think QE brought it up then. You know, I rem- nobody before. I don't know. I don't remember that somebody said Al Biruni. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Nathan, sorry. I was going to say I spoke to uh, Katz yesterday, and he's like, um, I was talking about how it's difficult to get people to cross platform, and he was saying how willing he would be to go on a neutral platform. And I says, well, these neutral platforms are usually uh, global dominated anyway, aren't they? I says you don't have any dominant like neutral platforms where with the same size on the on the on the flat Earth side because of how ridiculed it is. So I was like, no, there's no neutral platform for flat earthers. So I was trying to goad him to come in here, so I speak. But uh, I don't know, man. It's like I know both sides are never going to move from their position. And that's unfortunate because some of the best debates, really, are going to be with you involved against anyone else. So it needs to be, needs, so I don't know. I think actively we should try and work that out rather than keep repeat, repeating yeah, you're to people. A, you're a, you're you're a fighter, well. Tommy. So you want to fight, which is fair enough. Yeah. The doors are open here. This is an open bar, so to speak. Anybody can stroll in. And as I keep saying, I don't give a shit what they believe. We've appealed to them. We've debunked their arguments. Earlier in the show, I pointed out that I had to repeat something a hundred times to cats. Yeah? yeah. Well, do I want to chase him to his territory that he's calling neutral? No, I don't care. <laughs> However, if he's concerned in that direction, there's an open door for him or anybody else. Occasionally, people come in and say X, Y, Z person wants xyz from you oh you want that from me do you no oh, that's so nice i don't care what you want from me i know, I know. I know that's, hey, the tommy. that's what tommy tommy it's just an yeah. excuse it's just an excuse that they're know, using mate. because hang on let me finish it's just Sorry. an excuse that they're <laughs> all right let's try again it's an excuse because they've already lost And so the only way they could keep going with their audience is to say, uh, we need a neutral platform, we can't have one. And so they just linger this thing on for years now because there is no R. My argument was that both sides have a valid reason to to hold their position, even though that both of them hold them in different ways. No, they don't. No, they don't. That, That side doesn't have R or a position. How can you say that? No, I mean, as in coming under platforms to have a neutral debate. That's what I mean. No, if you got to have a no, position. Not with their for right, Tommy, hold on, hold on. You, you, you're talking past each other. What he, what, what you, um, tenth man's trying to illustrate to you, Tommy, is that they're not on the winning side of the argument. Now, I appreciate that they want a few concessions to be given them, and they need their territory to be fulfilled in order for them to challenge us. The minority in this discussion, because of course it's not enough that the entire Western world are behind them, and that we are generally ridiculed. No, no, no. They also need a quote unquote neutral platform. Obviously, it's not like they've got every advantage in the world. We're obviously in such an advantaged and privileged position, being held in such high esteem, that we should really come down to their level, shouldn't we? Obviously, with the respect that we get. We need to make it more fair for them. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep appealing to that, lads. Yeah, yeah. Tommy, this is now troll server. Say again, you almost Tommy, this is now troll um, server, just to, man. Just, just oh, to oh. let you be aware, cats can't yeah. ever face us because the two questions that we pin against him, and the, there was one, but there's now two. Obviously, one is, I do have gas pressure with our container. The other one is, given that you are aware that Einsteinian gravitation superseded Newtonian gravitation, why do you teach kids the lie? And his answer is, because it's in the national curriculum, and he uses that as a get-out, but it's not true. That doesn't justify teaching them a lie, because it has to be true, or at least based on truth. So teaching them the falsehood of Newton is still a lie. Yeah, but and he can't I think teachers, teachers have an obligation, well. right? I mean, teachers, teachers have an obligation to teach what's in the, in the curriculum, curriculum, whatever the books, to pass the exams. I don't really think that sometimes these are held up to the, the fringes of science. I think they're just to pass people's academic and understanding level. That these these tests aren't really to, yeah. um, you know, for, for actual truth. Because like J Jack and Jill went up the hill with some water and. You know that that's not a real situation. It's just a fairy tale, anyway. So, yeah, but why? Yeah, if it's in the curriculum, the, you don't get the luxury. Uh, hello, 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 hello. Sleeping warrior having the conversation. Hello. So, <clears throat> this is where it becomes a little bit off topic, but it's still relevant. Um, yes, it's in the curriculum. However, the teachers have to teach the curriculum. You're right, but if the curriculum's teaching kids the wrong thing because it is outdated and it needs to be modernized. Does that justify teaching them false science? I, and it's, there's a legal position. It it's literally says that in the lead case in it says that if you're teaching kids fundamentally the, the position based on current science, which is what the, the lead case said, then that would be okay. But they're not teaching it on current science. They're teaching it on the antiquated science, and that wouldn't be okay. So the question is, well, why don't teachers depart from it? And the answer is, as he says, I'm trying can't. to say, I don't, I, don't, I think point? it's because they're, they're just teachers that are coming to get their pay. It's they're not really responsible. We're trying to hold on a second. It's not, it's not really their responsibility to change the rhetoric or update the rhetoric of what they're paid to teach. I don't think it's down their responsibility to, you know, to uh, dictate what should be taught or <clears> not. So even. I think like, they're, they're the in lie. a position of, sorry. Are you condoning the lie? Because you say the teachers no, do I'm, have I'm the freedom to teach. Uh, I don't think it's a teacher's responsibility to make sure that the current rhetoric that has been that he has been given to by by governments to update. I don't think it's their responsibility to take on that that, that task. And you'd be and right. Fight the system. Hold on. Yeah. yeah hold on. And you're hold on, Owen. No, you'd be right. It's the headmaster's responsibility. However, there you go, the teachers do have the freedom to depart from it when there's good reason to do so, but none of them do. Uh, no, 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 that's not true. Where are you getting that? That's not true. They have Should the freedom to add something, to add something, right? Or to, like, give their own opinions about the curriculum. They have to teach it. They have to teach it exactly yeah. as presented. Doesn't matter whether it's false or not. That's the problem. No, no, no they that's have not to. true. Nathan, please put my thing on screen. You put section 408 on, right? Not yet. No. Oh, okay. I want to just rebut Arwin's refusal, the strong refusal that Arwin's just given. Are we on? Yeah, yeah, you presented. National, so, so you can type in national curriculum into Google, and then you can click on um, uh, curriculum by su subject. And then you can click on um, science programs of study, and then you get the actual national curriculum. And when you click into it, you get it in HTML or PDF. If you scroll down, oh, I've gone the wrong way. You're having a hang on. Don't interrupt Just him. Just wait till he gets to his point. Thank you. It it's got their mic wide open with this. It says in the document at the bottom of the document it says these programs of study are these programs of study are issued by law. You must follow them unless there is good reason not to. So it's law that they teach it, but they are allowed to depart from it where there is good reason to depart from it, and that would be because the Newtonian position in gravitation has changed. That would be a good reason to change to to, to depart from it, Arwin. Furthermore, just I, that's a very oh. fuzzy statement there. Good reason not, not to. What does it even mean? That doesn't okay, mean uh, uh, let me. Like good, good question, Arwin. Very good question. Yeah, you could say it's fuzzy, but that's why it's specifically, and that's Anthony's original point, goes back on track. That's why it's being pinned on conspiracy cats. If you are overtly aware, because you've been educated in Einsteinian gravity, that it is not the current position, then you are acutely aware of how incorrect it is. Now, when somebody comes along, you may have forgotten it. You could say. 
But when someone like Anthony comes along and says to somebody like Conspiracy Cats, why, when you are overtly aware that this is an incorrect position because you've been taught it at university, do you teach this lie to children? That's why it's specific. When you highlight the fact that there's a good reason not to, that would be that it's incorrect 106, nearly 107 years out of date. That's a good reason when it's not the current position. That's a good reason. When it doesn't happen, that's a good reason. And that is what the lead case said. The Dimmick case said that the Al Gore video was allowed to be presented to kids because it was based on current science at the time. Regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the science, it was based on that science. So it was allowed. Well, Newtonian gravitation is not based on the science. Yeah, I, just, that I, science just think, I just think that, look how hard it is for what? you guys to convince people about these arguments that you know are categorically contradictory. Yeah, yeah. And imagine a teacher in a, in a, in a, trying to convince a board that they shouldn't be, or the headmaster, that he feels that this needs to be re revised. And to push that with such passion that you guys have, because you guys are quite, you know, you understand the arguments and you're, you're very militant on them, but these people aren't. Militant on the dis they, they just defend it because it's what they teach and they, they've been you know called uh, upon hold on. to defend stop, it. Stop, stop, sorry, stop, but... stop, 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 stop. Yes, that's correct. For a broad stroke across the term teachers. Yes, you're right. This isn't what's happening. This started off, I'll do it again. We haven't got back on track, obviously, with a specific point being tied to a specific teacher in this instance, conspiracy cats. So while you can apply that broadly to every other teacher, yeah. Then no, in this specific example that that, that, that trying to call you quantum eraser, that sleeping warrior uh, is making, it's a specific person that's being charged. And I think the qualifying yeah, criteria doesn't necessarily need to be that you went to university and got the degree. If you're in this topic, I think that you by being aware of the issue, then that will qualify you for having a good reason not to teach it because you're aware that well, I don't, I don't think he no. I don't think he's got what? the confidence though to actually defend that position. I don't think he believes that Gaspar Jacotanic. I truly believe he thinks that's that's possible with his understanding of physics. So I don't think for him it's something that he really does genuinely feel like he's teaching the lie. Because even when talking to him, and I said to him, you, he agreed that you need a container the size of the atmosphere in order to demonstrate the eventual struggle that gravity has over these gas molecules, pulling them down, creating the containment that it's supposed to do with the gravitational pull. He said you need to contain the size of the atmosphere, so therefore you can't demonstrate it because even even if you had to contain the atmosphere, the atmosphere outside and, and, and tract a gas molecule going up in the atmosphere without kinetic, you know, the, the kinetic energy you sent it off with, it would eventually come back down. That's his theory, but it's a theory, but it could because it has mass. So I understand why he believes in that, and I do think he's teaching the correct rhetoric. I don't think he, he sees it the way that you do, so black and yeah, white what, that it's what that you're doing incorrect. There. What you're doing there, respectfully, is you're appeasing to his good nature because you think that he believes that Newtonian gravitation is correct, even though he knows that it isn't. So even though you might appease, might might lean towards his nature and think that he's not being dishonest, it's that's there's an objective truth here, regardless of his of his perception or his persona, which is that Newtonian gravitation has been superseded, regardless of whether he's a nice guy or not, or whether he believes it or not. It's been superseded. It's black and white. So in that light, it doesn't matter what his, what his um, belief is. It's a factual position in science currently that Newtonian gravitation has been replaced. Okay, but that's okay, appearing but... to consensus yet again. Even though you're saying it's the current rhetoric, I, I agree. But it's still the current, current rhetoric of the consensus, which are often wrong anyway. So even though even though Newtonian and uh, uh, Einsteinian gravity is both debunked now, it doesn't really matter which way they go. They're going to go. They're going to pull to a, fa a fallacy anyway. So. You know, um, it doesn't matter. Um, um, they can they can jump between the two to make sense in their world, in their paradigm. No, no, no. I do no, genuinely no, no. think right. that these things happen. Firstly, listen, Tommy, it's not accurate to say that Einstein has been debunked because LIGO is the current position and that was like $1.1 billion. That is the current position. And if people argue that you might not be right, okay. But the current position is Einstein, right? Now, that means that he hasn't, he's not been debunked. But they can't interchange between in between the two of them because they're not mutually exclusive. They're mutually exclusive. They're not mutually inclusive. You can't jump between the two of them. They're not even in the same geometry, and one of them has got a limitation to do with the speed of light, which the other one's instantaneous. They're not similar. Look, they've got quantum mechanics, yeah, and that is literally directly contradicting Einsteinian. So the fact of the matter is, they they yeah. already know that it's not true. And they're still rolling with it, trying to make us believe it. These these right. logo experiments with the with the, well, the, let's, the let's lasers. Let's Can I get in between there? Yes, because Arwen. Go. Arwin's been trying to get in for a while. Go ahead, Arwin.
Yeah, that all depends on how you're going to be taught about it, right? I got taught about Newtonian mechanics by a really good physics teacher, teacher in my school like 20 years ago, more. And he would actually say, look, this is to teach your mind about the mechanics because it has kind of been outdated. But Einstein mechanics, which have replaced it, are too complicated for this, the age of the students here. So Doesn't you matter. might be able to learn about it later. So he would Doesn't proceed matter. to teach us about Newtonian mechanics, no. but with the yes. default position pointing out where it is actually incorrect if students would figure that out intuitively, right? And ask okay, the so right yeah. question. So what about the gas, you know? Okay, hold on, say, yeah, hold on, Stephen Warrior. Hold on. What I think what I'm so, trying, to, trying to postulate is that there are teachers out there that would appreciate given their education and the standard of Einstein being taught to them in uni would express that to the kids at some level and now in saying I experienced this being expressed to me directly at some level by a physics teacher now presumably this was in high school when you would be taught this stuff so therefore there are people that are doing the example that Anthony would expect to some limitation even when I said to uh, Tommy earlier you've got a broad stroke of all teachers well actually no that doesn't apply either because Arwen's just debunked that statement by me so no, there are some teachers that instinctually know it's wrong and will even tell their students that at some level. Now, yes. when you've been pointed out in the case of conspiracy cats how wrong it is and where their education lies and how their education told them it was in a different geometry, then there's no excuse, right, Anthony? Well, but Arwin's but they, point was... Sorry. Hang on, hang on. Arwin, let me respond to Arwin's point. He said that basically it's too complicated to teach kids Einsteinian, which that may well be true, but that doesn't make it legal because the legal position is clear. If it's based on the current science, it can be taught. But if it's not based on the current science, which Newtonian gravitation is not, it shouldn't be taught. It shouldn't be anything more than a historical reference, but it doesn't say that it's because it's too complicated. So we do have visualization aids that we can demonstrate these things to get them to understand how the blanket stretches with mass and all that. So it's not true to say that it's too complicated. What you're doing is there is trying to lean, like say, well, it's too complicated so we can dismiss it. No, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. No, that's not what he did. No, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Hello? No, he qualified what a teacher did with him. That's not what he's saying. That's what he's saying he experienced. Yeah, I'm right. rebutting the argument that it's too complicated because that's cool. not the criteria. Yeah, the teacher, uh, Arwin, please, please, Arwin, trying to keep the flow going. Yes, but uh, uh, the teacher's not here to challenge that on, Anthony. Only Arwin, and he can only give his first-hand account of what he experienced. You're challenging the account and how it was delivered to Arwin. The teacher's not here, though. Uh, meanwhile, yeah, stop, 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 stop. Meanwhile, the focus of this conversation, third time trying to get this back onto the focus that Anthony originally brought up, there are two things that are charged at Conspiracy Cats' door because he is a teacher who is in this discussion overtly peddling his con. Well, in that instance, it's not like he can justify being unaware. And even at some level, as per Arwin's example, some teachers will still point out that there's a different opinion because they understand it and have been taught it at uni. Therefore, when you say, why are you teaching this to kids when you know it's wrong? You were taught that it was wrong. I'm telling you it's wrong with citations. Now, Tommy's saying, well, no, I just think he can get away with it. He's told me that he still actually believes that. No, he was taught otherwise. And that's been pointed out to him by Anthony. So therefore, in yeah. this one example, you can charge that individual and say, you're lying. You're lying to kids. That's the facts. Yeah, I, I, get, I, I get where you're coming from. But I was, my point I was going to elaborate on is that they always said that science is uh, something that is always open to be subject, changed and subjected to. And if they should, if they follow that religion closely to what they believe their version of science is, then they'll believe that once Newton thought he was correctly, and then we realise Einstein was right. And that would be the current science now that we should be teaching. But no, 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 no. No, no. We're not trying to challenge the system in terms of their understanding or even their teaching of the pseudoscience methods of put the word above the door and then make up a story and tell him about heliocentrism. Anthony isn't challenging that. He's not got such grand ambitions because he'd fail on his ass immediately. However, in terms of what he can achieve, he can point out where there's a wrong in the law. As far as the law is concerned, whatever the current science by way of justification is, can be taught to the kiddies. That's it. It's just as black and white as what they say can and can't be taught. If it's the current science, it can, by justification and precedent. 
Now, now you've got a precedent in it, great. You can say, this is the precedent. This was allowed, regardless of how right or wrong it was. Yeah, we're not trying to challenge that it's pseudoscience when it comes to Al Gore. There's just a precedent set. So the reason it can be taught is because it was the current science. Might be shown to be wrong, as you're saying, based on their standards that we're not challenging in this instance. Yeah, we know why they justify it. We're not challenging that. We should, if you want to live in an idealistic world where you'll wait your way into one of the cracks in law. No, you won't. You will never succeed in that regard. You have to work on precedent. Well, if it's not the current science, which Newton isn't, then there's a cut and dry case for it's not being taught in the way that it's laid down to be taught. And precedent set, you've set it. So this isn't current science. Why is it being taught? I thought... Uh, I, sorry, uh, go on, Yeah, I thought Arvin's point was actually very good because isn't that what Sleeping Warrior would like conspiracy cats to do is what Arvin's teacher did? Yeah. No, 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 no. Why well, you say yes? No, because that teacher, while that might be very noble of that one individual teacher, number one, it's not his responsibility in terms of the teaching. He should have cleared it with the headmaster first. That's the person legally that's responsible for that. So he should have at least checked. If he didn't, I don't know. We haven't got that part of the story. But that's one individual versus sure versus the law on what can and cannot be taught. I don't care about the individual teacher. We can pin it on an individual, as Anthony's doing with Conspiracy Cats, to make the point, but it doesn't change the fine letters of the law and the precedent set by Al Gore. If it's not current, it shouldn't be taught to them. Is Newton current, Anthony? No. Could I say something on it? If Conspiracy yeah. Cats really is aware, or like if he was really aware, like if he truly was aware and truly, this is what, this is what kind of bothers me, if he truly was aware that Newton is not the current pseudoscience uh, description for gravity, and Einstein is, then even if he can't teach that within the class, because he doesn't, he doesn't have the authority to do that, he could fight back within the system and say this is wrong, but he also could be correcting the other ballers over yeah. the past few years who've been claiming it as a force. Correct. And claiming Newtonian mechanics. Well, well, you know, well, he could be doing that. So, one second, just let me finish this part. So that tells me that he actually does believe that gravity is a force. He'd have to. Let me just elaborate when Tenth asked this question and I said yes, and then Nathan challenged it. What needs to happen in the national curriculum is that they get the Trump stamp that we get brandished against us. They should get it saying the Newtonian model is an archaic conception of how we believe that gravity used to be. Um, until Einstein invented his theory of general relativity in 1915, it, gravity was thought to be a force. Now we accept it is no longer a force. It is the curvature of space out. And that's the they need a tramp stamp. That's what it needs. Yeah. They used to think as an archaic conception that gas go down, go boom, boom, to force other gases up with buoyancy. Now we know better. Yeah, so give, the, give them the tramp stamp. And that way, the teachers will say, well, look, this is new. And they will then all say it because it's in the curriculum, right? It might take two or three years for it to go, for, go through. But once some fundamental changes in the, in the teaching, they'll all be talking about it. And why is it like this? And it's because it has been superseded. And kids should know that it's not the current position. Because like, like I said, I'm sure most of us weren't taught that Newton was wrong. Most of us were taught, well, this is how you pass your exam. Newton was right. No one ever told us anything about Einstein. I didn't know what E equals MC squared really meant until I got onto this topic. So that's the missing information that children should get taught because it's right that they get taught that it's contentious. However, when Conspiracy Cats is like throwing his weight around saying that, well, neutral platform, he can't talk to us because they're the only two questions that I want to ask him. How do you have gas pressure at a container? And why do you teach Newtonian gravitation when you know that it's not the current position in science? So, where'd you get our... Yeah.
Yeah, the, the, they are literally, literally the the current description of why something fall is appears appears to fall is because the Earth is actually coming up, and that object is in free fall, and it's that the Earth is in its future. That's actually how it's described. It's in the object's future to meet the Earth. That's the basics, the basic way of describing it. But ultimately, they don't want to say that because it, it makes everyone think that the Earth's floating upwards, right? Which we don't even say, but obviously that then gets pinned on us and then they come asking questions and then we can get to say, no, we don't think that. That's what you get told we get think. We don't think that. We think the Earth's not moving at all and that they're both wrong. So then we start talking about, well, why do objects fall? And that's when we start talking about the medium and then whether there's an electrostatic force or not. But ultimately, we're not talking about Newton anymore, which is what the, that is the position that we should be talking about. Well, it's. I think there's a whole other reason for not saying that. If Brian wants to repeat it, it sounds so absurd based on the current brainwashing of what they've been saying it was, that they say, you know, we can't go to that because that's worse than the made-up stuff we made up before. I was just going to yeah, say, it's crazy. I'll repeat it if you want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's that when we see what we think is, a, is an object falling to the ground, what they're telling us, is, what Einstein was telling us is exact what is happening is that that object is actually in free fall, which is its natural state, and the ground is actually coming up to meet the object, as opposed to the object going down to meet the ground, because the ground is in the object's future. Thereby, this allowing a globe, because uh, antipodal is going which way then? A antipodal? <laughs> okay, so here I am. I'm going up. I'm going up. I'm going up. Well, on their globe model, someone is below me. Are they going up? If they're going up, they're going away. So the globe's getting bigger. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Both both things don't make sense. It's just if you've brainwashed everybody that we're on a spinning globe, and then all of a sudden you say, well, you know, Newton's wrong about gravity, so we're going to accept Einstein. Then Einstein says, well, the ground is coming up to meet it. Everyone's imagery in their mind goes, well, if the ground is coming up to meet it and I'm coming up where I am to meet it, what about the guy on the globe on the other side? What's his up? That's where it's crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, Einstein's math is, is, is only relative to you. Relativity. It's only relative to you at one, one position. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, his equivalence principle. That's where that comes comes in. Okay, yeah. so then that discounts it right off the bat. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But that's why the conversation should be the way it is, like should be what we've just been describing, because it makes kids inquire about the real nature of the earth by asking awkward questions that the teacher's then got to try and stumble his way through, a bit like Professor Phil Bell. How, how do you explain all this to kids when it's like, no one thinks that the Earth's moving upwards, not even us, right? But that is that is the alternative position. It, it becomes farcical. Yeah, so that's why they don't teach it. I mean, we're answering yeah. our own question. Why, why isn't this taught? Well, because it got ripped to shreds really concisely without any of us stepping on each other or contradicting each other within about three minutes. I think the main word is relative. Yeah, that's, that's the main word, relativity. It's all relative. It's like, it's a description, like if, I'm, if I trip and I fall towards the floor, the floor is in my future. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that is true. But I said relativity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so rel uh, to me, relatively to me, the floor is in my future. If I drop something, the floor is in that thing's future, if it's falling towards it. Well, then Tommy's got an excuse uh, for the ring now when someone knocks somebody out. No, but the reason for that, but the reason for that vector that you're taking with the floor in your future is down to a bent fourth dimensional medium. Correct, Brian? Yeah, Nathan. That's when things get really, really tricky. <laughs> well, you're just falling towards the ground, but we're going to assign a vector based on a geodesic bent space time. Correct, Brian? In Einsteinian mechanics? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do we live in bent space time? No. 
So it's just a fourth dimensional invention by Einstein, a mathematical conjuring of an extra dimension that describes things in your future when the very notion of time derived from celestial movements is merely a concept. But yet that concept's being bent into a geodesic to define your future relative to your position with the ground coming up towards you as the globe flies through a geodesic in space-time. All right, relative to you, that makes perfect sense. I'm sure the kiddies will swallow that just as just as well as they did saying there's a magical unicorn force pulling you to the ground that's been superseded 107 years ago. Makes for good movies, though. It does well, make for good movies, yeah, but it doesn't change the fact that the kids, like Conspiracy Cats, is teaching him something that he does know is false, and he teaches it with, under the guise that it's, well, it's in the curriculum, but the curriculum says when there's a good reason to depart from it, you should. And when there is a good reason and he's not doing it, that makes it dishonest. Well, Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, uh, it just shows that Einstein, basically, he was just writing um, a, philo a philosophical book, but with equations as, as opposed to words. Isn't it? That's all it is. It's a philosophy, isn't it? Well, it's just the equivalence, because like that's why E equals MC squared is an equivalence with mass and energy. Well, it's, he's just looked, he's flipped it on its head and hypothesized about it. Wrong word. He suggested that it might be an alternative way, and it is an alternative way. It doesn't mean it's true, though. Remember you, know the, you, you remember the line in the movie? That's not a mountain. That's a wave. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you know, Anthony, that he originally wrote his equation... M uh, equals E over C squared, and he changed it. It wouldn't surprise me. I saw the article, the um, thing where he said, um, now that the mathematicians have got on, got hold of my theory, I no longer understand it myself, or words to that effect. And I thought, hmm, that's true. So he's baffled by his own bullshit by the end. Correct. That'll happen when you invent a completely new dimension. Other mathematicians will get hold of that, and then suddenly you don't know what the hell's going on. It has no representation <laughs> in reality whatsoever, because it never did. That's, That's what that bloody, bloody as idiot... As long would... as they don't go as far as to teach the emergent force of gravity what's that and all that what's that <laughs> that's the bending of space-time causing the force of gravity gravity's that's not a force bloody idiot. <laughs> that's what, what that bloody idiot did um ab science did it with me didn't he he said oh, I'll, I'll i'll mathematize his, his uh, egg experiment into a conceptual model and test it and then he created his model mathematically and declared that his model didn't work. Therefore, my test was fake. My test didn't represent reality based on his own model. And I just said to him, you've got, you've got a plus instead of a minus there, mate. Your model's wrong. And he, he didn't understand the humor in what I said, but my point was valid. He's created the model, the mathematical model, which he then based my experiment on and then declared my, mod, my experiment was invalid based on his model. And I'm like, hello, I've just done it. It proved <laughs> somewhere. And you're now telling me it's not. It's just a joke. <laughs> it's, it's funny. I've never had a mathematical egg. I wonder how it tastes. That's akin to that, 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 going, going that, that, into the garage with your broken car and then the guy says, yeah, we'll get it sorted. And you go back a few hours later. And the guy's looking on his computer at a model of your car. And he goes, hmm, in this model, <laughs> it says that your car's supposed to have an electric motor. And you go, yeah, yeah, it's been converted to gasoline. That's why I bought it to you. Well, the model says it shouldn't work. You go, yeah, yeah, but it is actually sat outside with, you know, needing an oil change and such like. No, no, this model says it shouldn't work. <laughs> right? Yeah, like it matters. There's one in reality, so I sat there, look, dripping oil. <laughs> yeah. 
it, it's like that confusion when you go to a motor factors and you're looking for um, a battery for your car and they give you a battery and its number is 92 and you look you go out and try and fit it to your car and it doesn't fit and you go back in and say this is the wrong battery this and it's because he's done he's looked up the wrong battery and he really needs a 94 but he hasn't realized that because he did it he did something wrong and he looks at his computer and he goes no this definitely says 92 oh hang on a minute there's a 94 here and then he realizes that he made an error but until he made that error he was adamant that that battery would fit your car it's only when you took it outside and realized it didn't fit your car because it was the wrong one that's that's the moment when you realize that your prediction your theory didn't work and that's what they do with their model all the time and none of it works what that happened just that happened to me just a few months ago i had to change the belts into my my toyota pickup so I went and got, you know, two belts from this one place, and then uh, I realized I needed three. So I went back, and uh, I took these two belts with me uh, that I bought, and then the guy says, uh, yeah, you do need three. I have them all, but these two you have are the wrong two. And I said, well, okay, well, then just set me up so I could change the belt. So he took those belts back. The guy who sold me from the same store had sold me two wrong belts when he was looking at the computer, like Anthony said. So now I have three belts. So I just put the belts there. And every time I start the car, that whiny screeching noise is there. My wife got tired of it because I never got to it. So she took it to our, our friend who's a mechanic. And he's about to do it because uh, I never got to it. And then he says, hey, you got the wrong belts. <laughs> so it's like, I said, wait, wait, how can this be? And so then I said, hang on to the wrong belts. Just have the mechanic get the right belts. So after it was all done, we took the wrong belts back to the same star and explained the whole story. The guy's look at his face was priceless. <laughs> That's it, though, because sometimes they can't understand how the computer can be so wrong, and it's because sometimes they, they are wrong. But when you're trying to persuade the guy that it's not the right part, it's like you're having a fight with a ball earther because he looks at his computer, he looks at you and thinks that you're daft. And you go, look, I've just been out and tested it. It's like he wants to come out and test it himself because he can't believe that his computer's wrong. It happens all the time. Yeah, right. it's in the movie. Because they, they lean too much on the technology to tell them what current reality is. And that's yeah. the problem. Have you ever seen it's the movie Brazil? The flexibility. Has anybody seen the movie Brazil? No, no, go on. If you haven't seen it, then I can't. The movie? Make... The movie, the movie called... Brazil? Yes. Right. Well, the guy is in perpetual trouble because of a, a, a clerical error that's happened because of a very archaic computer. So the computer drags through forms and then stamps them. And in the case of his form, it goes through, the computer gets jammed and it gets stamped incorrectly. And then suddenly he's in a whole bunch of trouble that he, he's got no no logical explanation for why he's in any of it and he's appealing to everybody going but i haven't done this this isn't me i haven't and they're just like it's on your form it's on the computer you're just wrong it wouldn't be on your form if it wasn't the case now they just can't accept it you know and the same similar example to um just to bring this back to ballers eventually you know because this is the, the the type of appeal that you have with somebody that's just so dependent so hopelessly dependent on their model and their belief that even when it fails they continually bash the same keys and appeal to the same thing well with my wife's car we tried to get it fixed there was a fault with it and every single time we went in they plugged the computer up to it and try and figure it out based on what the computer did and constantly going back and back and back and back eventually got so sick of it we went somewhere else the guy didn't plug a computer up asked us to describe what was happening turned the key in and listened to the car he went Hmm, I reckon your fuel pump's buggered. I was like, well, why didn't that show on the computer? He went, it's not hooked up to the computer. I went, really? I went, yeah, it's not hooked up in any way. It's just a pump. It just turns on when you turn the key on. And you're like, okay. So the guy who's constantly dependent on the OBD connection scanning the computer would have never found this out. And you, by listening for 10 seconds, figured it out immediately. Ripped out the back seats, got it out, changed it, done. All faults fixed. You're know, like, that would have never occurred because the computer's dependent on the person saying, well, you know everything. Well, the model's doing everything right. I know the globe model does everything right because I know I'm on a globe. Here's where it doesn't do what you think it should do. But it's right. It's still right. No, no, it isn't. No, it is. That's, what, that's where you, you're locking heads with somebody that's got a zealot belief in their model. There's no other way around that. You can't. You've got to eventually move away from them, which is like I'm saying with my car example. If somebody's so hopelessly dependent on the model that they've got, what, what are you going to do? Tell them, look, can you, can you think outside the box a little bit? 
Right. It's model worship. Uh, they cannot imagine that the model they are relying on could be wrong. And then they just get really confused and lost. I actually have a story. Do Look, we, don't, don't interrupt this. We've got mechanics examples coming. Go ahead, Neil. Uh, or was it Brian? I, I was no, going to say something, but I wasn't mechanic. I would suggest that you Take talk through everyone, Neil, and then the moment they leave a pause for you to talk, just just leave it as dead air, and then when they start talking, and then open your mic and talk straight through the middle of them again. Because Let's do that for ten minutes. There's a gate. There's a gate. There's a gate. There's a gate. Actually, there isn't a gate in G plus. <laughs> Carry on. No, there isn't a gate in G plus. Like plucking say, toenails. Yeah. Come on, speak, to, um, Neil. Uh, Same thing with Quantum Eraser. He kept telling me you're interrupt. When I was talking, he's not talking. Same thing with Brian. Right. When I'm talking, Brian's not talking. You hear him talking. I do. <sighs> it's called the delay. Come on, what Neil. Say, you want your point, connection. not your moan about you this. You had some oh, connection issues. Go ahead. Issue, go ahead. You know? Interrupt the whole point. They just need to listen. Like the guy was listening to Nathan's car. Didn't go into the computer. Ballers need to listen to us. Good point. Good point, Neil. Yeah. They should listen to us. You specifically. <laughs> ah, what do you know? Yeah. Hey, but it's true, you know. You know, keep your enemies closer even than your friends because... You need to understand them in order to overcome the division, the obstacle, the problem. So, yeah, they should, they, the, the anti-flat earthers, the ballers, they should be listening to us and not just to try to nitpick us apart, but to really figure out what's going on, the orientation, right? They should be listening to us if they, if they were wise, but they're zealots, so they don't. Brian, did you want to... Uh, yeah, I, I had a story, a real life story of something, of somebody who's stuck in a system, and when that system doesn't work, he can't understand it. Back in the 1980s, if you got a loan of money off of a bank, what they would do is they would send people out to your house weekly to get money. Let's say you were paying back 30 or 40 bucks a week, whatever. They would come to your house every week at the same day the same time and get the money. It was like really regimental kind of stuff. And the type of people they had doing it were really robotic people. You know, that kind of way. Those type of robotic people who just stuck to the system. <clears throat> well, my uncle got a loan of 10,000 off the bank. And uh, after a couple of months, he just got bored of paying him. And he just was like, I'm not paying him anymore. <laughs> right, that was that. That's the way he is. And there was a knock on the door, and my uncle had already made the decision that he wasn't going to pay anymore. So when the knock came, he'd normally know who it was, but because he had already made the decision several days beforehand that he wasn't paying the bank anymore, so when the knock came, he's like, who's that at the door? He went out to the door, and it was this guy. And he looked at him, at the guy, kind of thinking, why are you here? And um, to himself, he was thinking, why is this guy here? I already decided I'm not paying. And your man said, uh, I'm here to get the... He says to him, like, well, what are you here for? Oh, well, I'm here, like, every week to get the money, you know, to pay the bank. He says, oh, I don't, I don't pay that anymore. <laughs> right? He said to your man. And your man was standing outside the door. He said, but, but you can't do that. He said, but it's done, like. My uncle said, but it's done. That decision is over. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> he closed the front door. And he said, your man was standing outside the door looking at the front door, knowing it was never going to open again, knowing he wasn't going to get the money, but he couldn't understand how someone could just make that decision to just go completely against the system and just not care. He couldn't take it in, and he was standing outside the door, completely lost for, I don't know how, how long, not knowing what to do, because he had never encountered someone just telling him, no, nah, that's, that's over. You can see that. If you, if you break a minor road law... Right. So, for example, um, there's a, a car park. Right. Let's say it's on private property, so I don't get told off. Right. Because there's plenty of examples that people will know that this has happened. And there's an in and an out of the car park. But you're parked in such a way 
that it's really easy to just drive out of the inn. You're facing that way. It's only a few yards away. Right. You start driving and somebody waves you down. They go, what are you doing? You go, drive in. They go, you can't do that. You go, what do you mean? And they point at the sign. It says, no exit. See? No, you can't do that. And you go, oh, really? Oh, I see. So the sign is stopping me from doing that. Yeah. Sign says you can't. Oh, really? Watch this. You lift the clutch. You move forward. And you go through. And they go, I can't quite believe you've done that. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> the, the sign had very little effect. You know, I, I did precisely as I wanted. And the sign didn't stop me. It didn't have any authority over me. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> but people can't believe they've seen it happen. No, no, you can't do that. It's double yellow lines. You can't park there. No, no, you're not understanding. I have parked there. See? I'm getting out and locking my car. I have parked there. No, but you can't. No, I have. <laughs> you see? It's yeah. happened. It's the just truth, a convention. The truth is, is that that person can't do it. Isn't it? That person is the person who can't do it because that person is being told what to do by the sign. But when you do whatever you want to do, the sign means nothing. So right, he's projecting. binding him. Sorry. Yeah, that's that guy in that guy's mind, the guy that's stopping you, he's thinking, "I wish I was that guy. I wish I could go up to that sign, point at it, and go, you're not the boss of me, sign.'" <laughs> they should. Because it's all convention, you know, rules. And people that are that like rules, that like the parameters of rules, because they don't have something to occupy their mind with to follow, then if you suddenly break those rules in front of their nose, they get really flustered because they forgot that it's only a convention. That it's their agreement to follow the rule that makes them do it. Not, it's not some entity that forces them, see? Yeah, it's not civilized. Well, what does that mean? Oh, well, that's not part of the standards that I accept in this society. Oh, really? That's fascinating. Me, I think live it's and let like... live. Generally, if you're not hurting anybody, just live and let live. It's like when um, the sirens are going off whether it's a fire department or police, it doesn't matter, ambulance even. And it's oncoming traffic on the other side, and there's a great divider in between. So the people on the side where the ambulance is, they all pull to the right to give them the right of way. But the people, I mean, the people on this side that you're on, which the ambulance is not even near you, are all doing the same thing, and the ambulance can't jump that divider. And then it causes accidents. It's like the programming is immense. There, there was a, an incident in the past few weeks here in Ireland. Uh, it happened in Dublin. And it, it's really outside the box uh, type of bizarre situation for, for people to understand. Not, not so much here, but for maybe people in other places. Uh, there was these three lads who were uh, robbing places, and when the police would come along, they drive the wrong way down the motorway. That's how they were getting away. They were, so the police wouldn't chase them the wrong way down the motorway because they were just going to be caught. The, the police themselves would probably get killed, and there'd be other people getting killed. But what happened is they ended up hitting a truck because they were going the wrong way down the motorway. They ended up hitting a truck, and they, they all got killed. But one of them was a notorious, uh, as he was growing up, he was notorious for uh, burglaries and robberies and stuff like that. So what happened was when they put his, uh, his uh, coffin back into the house outside the church, one of his friends robbed the horse and all his friends drove through Dublin uh, protecting the horse from being stopped by the police uh, on a joyride with the horse, with his friend dead in the car, in the ca in the casket in the back, and it's just like <laughs> there were people like uh, there was a lot of comments from people who were overseas they couldn't understand this like 
but it's like they just don't care. It's just like it's something I'd never do, but I understand that you can do it if you want. And for more information on Ireland and Irish holidays, visit Ireland.com. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you were going to say they went down the highway the wrong way with the Hurst. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they did, but they, they travelled for a long while with the Hurst and they were being protected all around by cars and motorbikes of friends of theirs. Um, oh my, it's, it, yeah. <laughs> well, well, my mind was going crazy with the imagery. That was a great story. But at least like it's, if... it's an outside... Sorry, go on there. I was going to be a joke. I was going to say, if they were stopped and that's what they were doing, they just looked at, you know, nodded at the coffin and gone, it don't want to do it that way. Yeah. I, thought you, I, I thought you were going to say, have you no respect for the dead stopping us? So what, what, what were we talking about? Define conventions and people not understanding that you can literally do pretty much whatever you want if you can get away with it, right? Well, that's why they get away with teaching kids shit, because they can get away with it. Nice transition, Anthony, burying the story of the hearse with that comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tommy's still with us. Is Tommy gone? No, but they forget it's a convention. Oh, yeah. That's the problem. like, obviously... Oh. It's nice to hear like everyone's everyone's kind of like open and speaking their mind and stuff. So it's quite it's quite a nice chat. So it's quite nice to listen to what everyone's saying and stuff. But I get I get you guys are hard on the point that you know you know it's wrong. It shouldn't be taught. And you know it's a, it, you guys think that consciously you know it's wrong. And it each can teach you that it's a contradiction. So I think even though it teaches you it's a contradiction, I don't think it's really that. You know even though it te- even though like you said people passively teach it and say you know it says this, but we realise that Newton was wrong. But there's a theory about Newton. He was on he was onto something. And so science is always up to update itself. So really they should be open about that. But because they try to because they don't really address it, it does seem a bit you know a bit iffy. But really. You know, um... Okay, it's the second time you've said that science is open to change. And although last time I let it slide because Anthony's not fighting that battle in this regard, it's not open to change. So with the discussion with the guy on the show that's called Flat Earth versus Law and Order, the guy is essentially arguing the same point that science, their science is pseudoscience, which is to say it hasn't been through the method. And the method has an alternative hypothesis and a null. The alternative hypothesis is if A, then B. The null is if A, not B. Now, when you experiment, you vary A to see if it causes B. Now, if it doesn't cause B, you prove, that would be validate, prove your null. So you vary A and it doesn't cause B. So that statement, if A not B, is proven true. Equally, if you vary A and it does cause B, that statement, if A then B, is proven true. Because both A causing B and A not causing B can't simultaneously be true, one or other, alternative or null, will be proven at the end of the process. That is to say, upon systematic experimentation, you will prove your null, if A not B, or prove your alternative, if A then B. You can't have both, therefore violating the law of non-contradiction if it didn't prove anything. It can only, upon experimentation, prove your null, or prove your alternative. One or other is getting proven. That's the point of the process. It's not so open. Like, yeah. Could you say like gas pressure vacuum container that is like, you know, if you can't prove gas pressure vacuum container, then the norm must be true. Such as the other, other if you can't, if you can't demonstrate gas pressure vacuum container, then there must be contained. But that must be that's proving it without having to do it. Because if you can't do one, one of the two must be true. So if you can't demonstrate it with a practical demonstration, then you can't, you shouldn't believe it, and that's what gas pressure. You can't demonstrate it because pressure, gas pressurising on itself is, is off the walls of, the, of its container. You can't have pressurised gas without it being contained. But that's not a hypothesis so based, though. No, it is. You, that is absolutely a hypothesis, actually, Arwin. 
you can qualify the effect as pressure and the requirement antecedent is in fact the cause. The cause of gas pressure is the force exerted by the gas on the walls of its container. Yeah. Okay. Ah, you didn't know that, did you? Not been paying oh, close right. enough attention to QE's law, presentations. I, I was just going by that gas pressure without a container was mostly based on natural law, but I guess you could put that in a hypothesis to prove it. Sure. Absolutely. It's about, about well, it. it's 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 been on QE science presentation for about the last four years, but there we go. <laughs> I must have missed that part. Yeah, indeed. But even the way that Nathan was, the way you were talking about Nathan, you were saying, well, if A is true, then B cannot be true. So just like a central gas pressure for a container, if you can't have the other, then the norm must be true. So the opposite to, if you can't have it, if you have no other demonstration of it without it being contained, then obviously we must assume that we are contained, and it's not. It's the um, what do you call it? The antecedent, right? And that's is that like the the null as well? It's behaving in the same sort of way. The obvious, it must be true if you can't prove the one. I wouldn't say assumed. I'd say we're contained. I, I'd say that's what makes you a flat earther because you're more confident that you're definitely contained. Whereas me, I'd say that that is a very, it's more likely. I definitely agree with that that hyper, you know that that idea because otherwise gas would just fill. I don't think it's space out there. Gas more would likely, fill it. you know, we know over time entropy. Okay, there's a standard response to somebody that gives you the answer. Well, it's more likely. All right. Well, to show the antithesis, you've got to show gas pressure without a container. Yeah, you're saying it's a false dichotomy. Exactly. So what will be the exactly third? Exactly what I told my son last night. You must demonstrate gas pressure without a container right here for me right now. It's hard for me to disprove their, their notion of their faith that these gas molecules eventually lose the battle of gravity and come back down, causing pressure. You know, I can't prove or disprove that. that, that. Sorry, their, their assertion is gas go down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls falling into <laughs> a fish tank. <laughs> Yeah, gas doesn't do that. Gas expands in all directions. It's not going down, go boom, boom with gravity. So then they say, well, why is it not rushing up, up Mount Everest then, Nathan? It is. Ah, but it's not rushing though, is it, Nathan? Right. Yeah, it's gone from, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. It's expanding at high velocity in all directions from the ground towards the top of Everest. Yes, it absolutely is expanding upwards. Well, uh Towards the top of Everest. Know, I'm not say this because in pressure has right. no equal directions. You'd have equal pressure everywhere, but that's not why. No, we're not contained. Well, no, we have dynamic <laughs> systems, but no, you can only yes. you can only achieve that delta as a result of having containment in the first place. So while this ham-handed uh, devil's advocate position from Tommy would assert that you can have equilibrium in containment, that's true. But we have a dynamic system, and you'd have to have the gas pressure in the first place to achieve that dynamic system you're appealing to. Right. Within the dynamic system, even though there's a gradient, within that gradient, every gas particle, assumed to be particle, is still, like every other particle, moving in all directions as it being gas. So despite the gradient, it's still moving in all directions. Yep. Gas does not go down, go boom, boom. It expands in all directions to fill the availability of volume it has to fill. If the sky was an availability of volume for gas to fill, then gas would fill it. We'd all be dead. We'd have no gas to breathe. The gas would fill the space. And what do you know? They call that availability of volume space. Outer space. A vacuum. That would be availability of volume for the gas we breathe to fill. And fill it, it must. It's called an entropy increase. It's a law of nature. Gas expands in all directions to fill the volume it has to fill. And with that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, hitting the PayPal link, helping me out fix my projector and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video.